Ladies and gentlemen, we are live. Good evening and welcome. Uh, we're going to do a, a quick intro. Uh, I'll check who's in the chat already and then we'll get stuck in uh, to the topic for today. So here we go. I think uh, if everything's working, we'll soon find out very quickly. But if there's no audio or if the picture's awful, I'm sure you guys will tell me. So we have in the live chat, I saw earlier Peter Reid. I did wonder if that was the former England footballer and former Sunderland manager, Peter Reid. I suspect not. Hello and welcome. Uh, we have, yes, loads of hellos in the chats. Good to see you all there. Uh, we have Emil Varga, big CRT, hashtag YFBG. Good name. Hello, C3DPO, Spicy Reef, Nitrox72, plenty more as well. Bearded Reef's in the house. Uh, fellow YouTuber. Hello, Ross. How are you doing? Right. So today then, this is going to be a, a Q&A session, basically. I've gone through, I've made a video recently that you might well have seen, which is making a saltwater aquarium for $182 or 182 pounds. Uh, and I uh, did two videos or three videos, including showing you how to cycle a tank. And I went through the comment section of those videos, pulled out the questions that I think uh, were probably either the best questions, the ones that needed explaining, or uh, the ones that were asked most commonly. So, uh, I'm going to go through all of those questions. There's 22 in total. There's a few more that came through in the last half hour that I'll pull out as well. Um, and I'll go through them in kind of as much detail as I can. Now, there will be some people who are new to this channel. So welcome along. Uh, and people often say that you shouldn't take advice from someone until you've seen their tank. So I'm going to kick things off by showing you my tank. Let's just press play. Right, so this is quite a low-res uh, uh, picture because it's a live stream and it only does 720p, but I'll put a link in the description. It's a private video, but I'll put a link in the description and you can see the full 4K video. So this is my main tank. It's been running for about three and a half, four years, mainly SPS corals. Most of the SPS corals are at Aquapora. Um, and as you can see, it's quite well established and uh, quite nicely grown out. So this is uh, this is my uh, my tank. This is all uh, this is um, white lights as well. So this is during the day, no blue lights, no hiding stuff, uh, and it's quite a powerful camera. So if you put this up on a a big laptop or a TV screen, you will see everything. I don't hide things. Uh, there's uh, there's algae. If you look on the um, on the outlet nozzle from the uh, from the uh, return pump, you can see a little bit of algae there. There's algae around here and there. I don't hide anything. It's all there. You can go and check it out and have a look and see what my tank is like. Um, I've been through a few up and downs with it. I did have dinoflagellates, which are a nasty pest to get um, that are not uncommon. And I did also have uh, cyanobacteria in the early stages. Um, but I've not had anything that was especially difficult to beat, actually, for me. It's all been pretty much plain sailing so far. So that is my tank. We'll get rid of that. Um, as I say, you can check out the, um, uh, the, the, the link in the description if you want to go and see the tank in full. Other things to talk about before we kick into the questions. So I know that there are loads of questions coming in already. We've got uh, 31 so far uh, and counting. So I'll try to get to any questions I can that appear in the live chat as well. So do let me know if you've, um, if you've got any questions that you want uh, on anything at all. Ideally, the uh, setting up and running a, a cheap tank, but anything uh, you want to know about, just let me know. Other thing, one final thing. There are no stupid questions today, okay? I will try to explain everything in the most simple way I can, but if you don't understand something I've said or if I've not explained it properly, ask again. Ask me to clarify it. And if there's something that's on your mind that you've just been scared to ask because you don't want to look daft, there's no stupid questions. Uh, this hobby is a minefield when you first start, uh, and I will answer absolutely anything. And uh, everybody in this chat is always lovely. We're always really nice and friendly. So ask any question you like. Uh, and there will be no judgment whatsoever. So with that being said, then, let's kick off with the first question. This is from DJ Dorrit, Doug Dorrit, runner, uh, owner of a frag farm in the UK. Alex, you are a tremendous contributor to this hobby. Keep up the great work. Ah, oh, well, that's embarrassing. That's not a question, is it? How's that going there? God, Doug, come on. All uh, right. So proper questions then. First question, Bogeyman Shankers, great name. Uh, says, great video, but why not go for a Fluval Evo? It has a great filter section, plus the light isn't bad, and it costs less than £185. Now, the reason I put this question up is because I got asked by probably half a dozen people who felt that uh, the Fluval Evo is 
a better way to go. And there are a couple of reasons I didn't go for that tank. Uh, let me actually show you what the Fluval Evo looks like if you don't know. So here it is. It's a, oh, that's just put me in the corner. There we go. So Fluval Evo is a 50 litre or thereabouts um, aquarium. And that's 50 litres, including a little filter section at the back. Uh, really popular, really nice little tank. Fluval are a good brand as well. Um, and it's been, uh, well, in fact, one of the reasons I didn't make the video on this tank is because it's been done. So loads of people on YouTube have set up this exact tank and shown you what to do. So I'm not showing you anything new there. Uh, and there wasn't much I could cover off that, uh, that hadn't been so, uh, shown already. However, the main reason uh, was because this tank is a little bit limited or a little bit more limited than the tank I've gone for. So at 50 litres, it's a reasonable size and it's perfectly decent um, as a first tank. And you could be able to keep a couple of clownfish in there, that sort of stuff. You'll be able to grow on corals as well. There are loads of people who've had great success with, uh, with nice little LP LPS corals and even SPS corals. You can upgrade it as well. So it is a good tank, but it's only 50 litres. And the whole point of uh, these videos were to show you that you can set up a tank that looks awesome, doesn't have to be just cheap and looks rubbish, but also that you can upgrade it. There are so many people, and I did the same myself, who get into the hobby and then six months later realise their tank is too small uh, and they want to upgrade. Um, and that was the point of this tank. So the idea really, and let's switch to uh, the tank so you can see it. So the idea really of this tank was that you can you can expand and develop with it as you grow in the hobby. So this is it with uh, the lid off. So I've shown you with um, the, uh, the lid on as well on the uh, on the video. Uh, but it's it's just got so much more potential. 100 litres of water. You want to be a little bit careful with adding fish and you don't want to put too many in, but it gives you a little bit more capacity for, for fish and a ton more space for corals. You can also upgrade it as well. Um, you can add in a, a skimmer. You can add in other filters. You can add in more flow, all this sort of thing. So really, the reason I didn't go for the Fluval Evo, despite it being a very, very good tank indeed, was that I felt it was just a little bit too limited and I wanted to show something that you can grow with and expand and progress in the hobby and develop as you get a bit more confident. So that is the, uh, that's the reason I didn't go with the Fluval Evo. Nonetheless, good tank and plenty of people out there have done it as well on YouTube and have made a good fist of it. Question number two, how do you work out what size wave maker you need uh, for your tank size? And this is a really good question. So the Oh, sorry, it's Mad Hatter 78. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'll try to read out everybody's names. Oh, and all these questions, by the way. So I've copied and pasted them for the most part, but I only have 200 characters to play with. So I've paraphrased or edited some of them, um, but I've kept in the, the question as it is. So how do you determine what size wave maker you need for a tank? Really difficult question. Probably the, if you want a simple answer, the best thing to do is find a bulk reef supply video uh, about flow and they will tell you how many thousands of litres or gallons per hour you need for uh, X, you know, for a hundred litre tank or whatever. I'm going to try to give a, a slightly different answer to that because I don't think it's necessarily helpful to do litres per hour um, per tank or times turnover, uh, really, I should say. So the answer is, in my opinion, that you probably can't or you'll struggle to, to add too much flow. So the more, the better. Corals uh, really benefit from flow. There's all sorts of things it does. If you've watched any of the BRS TV videos, you'll know this already. It takes waste away from the corals. It brings oxygen to them. It brings nutrients. It brings food to them. It brings elements like calcium to them. Um, and, uh, and it helps them move around and look cool <laughs> at the end of the day. So massively important. A lot of people will say it's more important than flow. Uh, sorry, more important than light. Some people say light's more important, but whatever. The point is, it's really important. So flow is great uh, for, for your corals and really important for them, but it also does other things. So if you've got a, a fairly still tank, you'll find you get a load of detritus, so fish poo basically, and uneaten food that will settle on the bottom. Whereas when you turn the pumps up or you have a load more flow, it's suddenly, like if you put a second pump in when you've not got enough flow, you will see the waste literally lift up off the sound bed and then go into your filter or whatever. So um, it uh, it helps keep detritus from building up and, and setting on the sound bed as well. Um, it does gives the tank a cool look too. So how much do you need then? How much flow do you need? You can't really have too much with the caveat that it is possible to go too big. 
But I would always say that it's better to go too big than too small because you can always dial a, a big pump down, but you can't turn a small pump up above 100%. So get the biggest pump your budget can afford with the caveat that it's better to get more small pumps than uh, just one big pump. So I would far rather you get two uh, pumps like this. This is a 4,000 litre per hour, this uh, Jekod one. Price keeps going up on Jekod, by the way. 70 quid now. I think it was 55 quid when I made the video, like three weeks ago. Anyway, another matter. Brexit, COVID, all that sort of stuff. So it's you're better to have on a tank of 100 litres, one pump will like this, a 4,000 litre per hour pump, will probably be fine for the sorts of corals that you're likely to keep. Soft corals, basic beginner corals, maybe LPS corals, that sort of thing. So that will probably be fine, but it wouldn't hurt and it would be better to have two of these. Um, and I mean, you could get crazy and even go for two of the next one up, the 8,000 litres per hour. Again, just turn them down. But two of these would be fantastic on a 100 litre per hour tank. As much as anything, if you've got one pump, these are good because they have different flow modes. So you can get kind of waves going and you can get pulsing and all that sort of stuff. But if you've got one at either end of the tank, they kind of crash into each other and they create a bit more kind of natural uh, flow patterns that you get in the ocean. So something for, for a 100 litre tank, two of these would be amazing. One of them would be would be fine. So that kind of answers the question, although I've kind of uh, skipped it and I've not given you a blanket answer. But the blanket answer is go and check out the BRS TV videos uh, and see what they have to say. So now we've caught up with that. I'm going to try to look for <laughs> some amusing comments going on already. Uh, I'm going to try to look through uh, to make sure I've not missed any uh, any questions on that topic. And, and as I say, so as I go along, if there's something I don't explain properly or I've not said uh, something in a way you understand or whatever, I don't talk enough, then tell me and I'll try to catch up and uh, and fill out uh, the, the missing blanks. Uh, I don't think we've got any such questions there, though. No, we're all good. Right. Happy days. So uh, that question is done. Go away. Next question. Question number three. This is from Vikingo987. Thanks for the video. What would be the cost of running this type of small tank, uh, small tank setup and how much uh, work would it involve? How likely in such a small tank for wipeouts? Now, I've paraphrased this one because it was too long but you were talking about um, how likely are you to get wipeouts from fish and wipeouts from corals, given it's a relatively small size tank. And actually that's one point. So I did get a few comments that I'm not gonna pin up because they were uh, a little bit feisty, a little bit spicy, um, but they were suggesting that it's a really small tank. Um, and hundred liters is not a big tank, but in my opinion, it's certainly not a small tank. It's two and a half feet long, which gives a good amount of swimming space. So. Um, I don't accept that it's a, a, a small tank. I think it's a reasonable size, to be fair. Anyway, the first part of this question is really pertinent, so running costs. And this is a really tricky one to answer. So it, ultimately, this can be as cheap or as expensive as you want it to be. So if you just want to do it as cheap as possible, all you'd really need is food, and you can get some pellet food. I'm not saying this is the best food in the world, although actually I would say, you need to look for ash content. And this is 8% ash. And ash is basically the amount of phosphate. So you don't want high ash content. Anyway, um, so you just need food like this. I don't know how much this costs, five quid, 10 quid. And it'll last probably six months on there if you've got a few fish. It's a dirt cheap, not even relevant as a cost. And then you'll have uh, the cost of water changes. And you could probably do 10% water changes for sort of five pounds or $5 a month on a 100 litre tank like that. Um, in fact, let's just pull the tank back up so uh, we can see what we're dealing with. So, yeah, so you could probably do sort of 5 or 10% water changes for, uh, sorry, 10 or 20% water changes for around the £5, $5 mark, £10 a week, ten, uh, uh, $10, something like that. So not a lot of cash. And actually, at the basic level, that's all you need. Um, so it can be as cheap as that but it can get a lot more expensive. And the reality is you're likely to want to add a couple more fish, maybe um, probably quite a lot of corals. Uh, and then you might want to start upgrading equipment uh, and all that sort of stuff. So it can be as expensive as you like, really, even a small tank like this, you can end up spending thousands quite easily, um, but you can do it cheaply. So how much does it cost to run? How long is a piece of string really? But it is possible to do it cheaply. The one thing I would say with uh, with this is though 
the I mentioned the cost of water changes. Water changes are just so important on a tank like this. It doesn't have much in the way of filtration. So water changes are just are just huge, really important to do. And it would be worth if you want to save money on water changes in the long run, I would point out, buy yourself an RODI filter. And then you have control over the water you make. An RODI filter is just a it's a fancy Brita filter, basically, a bit more advanced than that, but it just filters your tap water and makes it into crystal clear or pure water with nothing nasty in it that you can use in your tank. And they're you'll probably spend 100 quid buying one in the first place. So they're quite expensive, particularly when this setup costs 180 quid for the fish only or 300 quid for the reef ready. But 100 quid, that will save you money in the long run because water is uh, next to nothing. Um, and most importantly, you'll have control over the quality of water, which means you can have zero TDS uh, water, which is basically there's nothing bad in it. Whereas if you buy it from your local fish shop, some might have zero TDS, but others uh, have quite high. The worst I've seen was I asked them how, what their TDS was, and they said it was about uh, they don't let it get higher than 80. And I wouldn't flush my toilet with 80 TDS water. So, uh, yeah, well worth getting uh, one of those. But how much does it cost? Really hard to say, but can be quite cheap. Um, and how much work would it involve? On a tank like this, not an awful lot. So in video two, I showed you the uh, little water change siphon thing that you can use to uh, suck out the gravel. So that's uh, relatively easy. It takes So I've got a 150 litre tank just over there to my left, and it takes 10 minutes to do a water change. No time at all, so even less on a tank like this. And I use the same uh, gravel cleaner, water siphon. Um, so you could spend half an hour a week quite easily. You'll need to clean the glass probably a couple of times a week when it gets uh, when it gets up and running. But it can be pretty easy, and there's not an awful lot to it. Maybe wash out the filter in salt water uh, every, I don't know, couple of months. Not Not very much. You could get away with not a lot of work. But at the same time, um there's i did a, a video recently that i called something like um watch this before you get a saltwater aquarium and on my main tank wow i do a lot of maintenance on that and i put a lot of effort into it so uh so you can spend as much uh, much time as you want final question on this bit uh, how likely it, uh, how likely are you to get wipeouts so fish wipeouts and coral wipeouts is what he was talking about um and coral wipeouts pretty unlikely you don't often get all corals uh, dying i think you've you've been very unlucky if you've got that or some something's gone pretty majorly wrong so you're not likely to get coral wipeouts especially with soft corals if you get stony corals as a beginner brand new they're a little bit harder and they can uh, can go wrong but if you get soft corals you're unlikely fish wipeouts again pretty unlikely the only chance really is if you introduce a disease uh, and then you can have a problem but disease is you, they, they do exist, of course. Plenty of people will have stories of, uh, of fish of fish wipeouts in the chat, I'm sure. In fact, I'll click over and see if people are talking about them. Um, but it's pretty unlikely. Um, so how likely are fish wipeouts? It's so inconsiderable, inconsiderable that it's not really a, a risk worth thinking about, in my opinion. But it is possible, of course. And the less effort you put into it, the more neglected it is, the more likely you are to have problems. But it's it's pretty unlikely, I would say. So let's catch up and see if there's any questions on those points. Yes, clean sand, only thin sand bed. Yeah, so thin, I think I used, my sand bed was probably less than an inch in this that you can see. Uh, so you don't need a big sand bed at all. You don't need a deep one. It'll only get blown around with the flow pumps anyway. Uh, I think that's all good. Utilitarian fish we've got, I'll come back to that. Peter Reed, former England manager, is in the chat. Uh, I'm 15, maybe not in that case. Uh, uh, let's answer this one. Saved up for an all pond solutions marine tank. Here you go, Peter. Uh, you've saved up for an all pond solutions marine tank. Are they any good? I've bought some all pond uh, solutions stuff. It's very much at the budget end. So you get what you pay for. It's not going to be absolutely fantastic, but they're fine. So yeah, uh, it, it should be okay. And I think I'm right in saying that there's nothing else there. So no other questions that I've missed. We're all good. So those are the answers to that question. Uh, next one, question four. This is from Hognose Boy. Would anemones be suitable for this tank or would you need to add lighting uh, like most corals? Could you instead feed it coral food as a supplementation? Right. Now I'm going to caveat this by saying I've never kept an anemone. I've kept rock flower anemones, 
but I've never actually kept uh, a full-on um, bubble tip anemone, the proper anemones that you're talking about, the clownfish uh, host, other way around, the host clownfish. Um, so I've never kept one. But the reason I've never kept one is because they're notoriously tricky to keep, especially as a beginner and especially in a new tank. And they uh, they can walk over, they can uh, move across the rock work, and they've got a little foot that kind of sort of shimmies across and they can move over and sting your corals and move into places you don't want them to be and all that sort of stuff. And they're a bit of a, they're a bit of a faff. And the chances are, if you know what you're doing and you know where it'll be happy, you can put it there and it'll stay still. But otherwise, if you don't know what you're doing, and I count myself in the category of people who don't know what they're doing, um, probably I can have an educated guess, but they're a bit of a bit potluck, to be honest. So they're a bit tricky, especially in a new tank. And uh, I would probably avoid them for this tank, but there's no reason you couldn't. And if you research their requirements, then yep, this is perfectly uh, suitable for that kind of uh, that kind of creature. So it is possible. But do your research and ask someone who knows about anemones. Ideally, sign up to a forum, Reef to Reef in America, or Ultimate Reef in the UK. Um, and could you feed it coral food as a supplementation? Uh, I think I would feed an anemone something a bit more meaty than coral food. So maybe something like uh, mysis shrimp, even, uh, which is what I feed my fish anyway. So there you go. Now, I answered that question. I put that one up because loads of people wanted to know about anemones. Uh, when I first got into the hobby, all I wanted was an anemone and clownfish. And then the more I looked into it, the more I got put off. So I've never kept one because of that. Um, and I like corals. I've kind of grown into corals. So, But yeah, they do look so cool. And I completely get why uh, it was such a popular question. Just quickly check the old uh, comments to make sure I'm not missing anything. No one's asking questions around that. I think we're all good. Would you recommend a jeb out? Right, fine. So question number five. Again, this is on uh, the theme of what can you keep in this tank? And this is from Mr. Man. Can I grow acros with this? So can I grow acropora corals with this setup? And I'll just flick back to um, my tank because that is an acropora dominated tank. So acropora corals, or acros for short, if you don't know, are the corals, and I'll just hover over with my mouse. So it's in the center of the screen. This is an aquapora here. That's called a strawberry shortcake. Oh, fish going crazy. This is an aquapora. This is an aquapora. They're all, all the um, the branching, typical kind of reef building corals that you see. That's an aquapora. They're small polyp stony corals, or SPS, and they are some of the most difficult corals in the hobby to keep. Um, some are a little bit easier than others, but generally they're pretty easy. And I answered this guy's question saying, no, just don't do it at all, because I'm guessing that he's a, a beginner. And with most people watching this video, you're going to be a beginner. You don't want to keep um, any of these kind of corals in, uh, in, in a tank like, let's switch back to it, in a tank like this. This, is, this tank is not designed uh, with uh, SPS corals in mind, certainly not Aquapora. If you knew what you were doing and you've got a bit of experience, then yeah, absolutely, you can keep SPS corals and aquapora in a small tank like this, 100 litres. I keep aquapora corals quite happily in the tank to my left, 150 litres, but it does have a sump, bit more filtration, a bit more advanced stuff. So it is possible, and it is something you could grow to, but it's not what the setup is designed to do. Really, this setup is designed with soft corals in mind, LPS, and then graduating onto some SPS, but probably beginner SPS only. And even then, that's much later down the line. So short answer, no, do not keep um, aquapora corals in this, uh, in this tank. Now, I'm just going to go to my little mini fridge and crack open another beer. And whilst I do that, I'll have a look at the chat and see if I've missed any questions. Uh, aquaporas, no. Oh, yeah, you need a lot of flow for aquapora. Reef the sea forever. Yes, good point. You need a lot of flow for aquapora. In fact, uh, in fact, so you see this tank here, the flow is coming from the top left hand corner and there's a tiny bit of water movement. And I think that pump was actually turned up relatively high, might have had it low. I had it low and then high at different points anyway. So not a lot of water movement going on there. But if I switch back to my tank, which has an absolute ton of water movement going on, in fact, let's wind back so you can see. So if you see the top of the screen there where the water's moving, and if you see on the left-hand side, you've got the flow coming in and battering it around. I have four uh, MP40 pumps. They're quite strong pumps. Um, and this is a relatively low part of flow during the day. It gets a lot 
um, spicier than that, and I have a, a lot more flow. So you need an absolute ton of flow for Aquaphora, and if you don't have it, they're going to look rubbish. Um, so yeah, it's really not designed. Uh, the tank was really not designed with uh, with Aquaphora in mind. So steer clear of it. And if you're a beginner, just don't don't get aquarium. Don't get SPS as a beginner. Graduate onto them when you've been in the hobby. I don't know six months a year, and you you've understood um, how LPS corals work, what they need, all that sort of stuff. Next question. In fact, just have a quick last look. Uh, yeah, I need a ton of flow. Uh, right, fine. So question number six, Hackman239 asks, I thought you needed a powerhead on saltwater tanks, even if you don't have corals. Now, this was on the first video. And on the first video, the tank was set up just to keep fish and inverts like uh, clean the shrimp, hermit crabs and those sorts of things, which without even without corals, you can have an awesome tank with clownfish, maybe some gobies and a load of shrimp. There are so many different cool shrimp, crabs and all that sort of stuff. Loads of character. It would still be an awesome tank. And I'd personally like to do that. So the question is, though, I thought you needed a powerhead, even if you're only keeping fish. You don't need a powerhead if you're just keeping fish. So all you need is some kind of water movement on uh, on a tank with um, with just uh, with just fish. So on this tank, as you can see, you've got the power head on the left. But if we were to ignore that, the filter on the right, which is that enormous great uh, black thing at the back, that basically sucks in water at the bottom and pushes it out. It's just about the water line where the um, the uh, the water comes out. And if the power head was off, that would be very gently disturbing the water surface. And that is all you really need for fish because that just oxygenates the water. You must have, absolutely must have some kind of uh, surface water movement, unlike with goldfish tanks, for example, where you just have a little bubble dripping up. Must have some kind of um, surface water movement and the more the better. But technically you don't need um, uh, flow for, for fish. It's probably what they're used to and they're used to having more flow. If you've ever been diving or if you've ever seen fish in the wild, there's a lot of flow around and they're used to it. Um, but it's not absolutely essential. With that being said, I would always have a, a power head in there to create more uh, more flow, keep the detritus off the um, off the sand bed, and it probably is beneficial to the fish anyway. But it's not absolutely essential. Um, but he asked because I didn't put it on for the um, for the first part of the tank. So there you go. There's that question. Just check again quickly. Oh, pom pom crabs, C three DPO. Yeah. <laughs> so pom pom crabs, and I'll pull them up so you can see what they are. But um, that's the exact sort of thing I'm talking about. So with, with a tank like that, and if you're just keeping inverts and, and these sorts of things, there's just so many cool little critters that do such amazing things. Actually, pom-pom crabs, well, I was going to say they're not too difficult to keep. In my experience, aren't especially difficult to keep. Um, but I didn't keep them as a beginner, so maybe uh, maybe they are more difficult. I don't know. But these are, these are pom-pom crabs, uh, and that's just blow that up a little bit so uh reef builders website here we go so they have these little uh, anemones on their uh, front pincer claws and they use them to fight off things they're so cool really really cool i have i think i have two although one of them might have died i only ever see one um but amazing little critter and there's just you, i mean there's endless cool critters you can have even in a tank with um, without corals so yeah good point c 3 dpo uh, well made and I need to pour my beer now. So as I'm pouring that, we'll look at question number seven, which is from JB Murphy 4. Uh, is it hard to add a sump as an upgrade to this tank? Or is the sump not needed on uh, this smaller tank since it's possible to do 20 to 30% water, percent water changes if needed? You could add a sump to the tank. You could do it. I personally wouldn't. And I think it might be a little bit of a risk. So the way you add a sump to a tank like this, and I'll pull it back up again, is that you have to drill, <laughs> literally drill two holes in the back um, in either corner and put plumbing in pipes in that go down to, uh, to your sump. And so one will spill the water over, one pushes water back up. So it would be possible to do it. It's five millimeter thick glass, not particularly thick. I would be worried that this is perhaps a little bit fragile and it would be very easy to break it. Um, Apparently it's not difficult. I've never drilled a tank, but apparently it's not difficult. But it's the sort of thing that could go could go wrong. And if you want to add a sump to this tank, yeah, you can do it absolutely. But probably not the best thing to do. And I would personally prefer to buy a tank that um, has a dedicated sump already. Maybe go secondhand. Um, with that being said, you don't. I think there are. You can get overflow 
uh, that I can't remember what it's called. There was a video I did about two years ago. There was a, a, a news monthly video. And there was a company that brought out an overflow set that meant you didn't have to drill it. And it just sits on the back of your, your tank. So you could do it that way. I don't know if that's sold in the UK. I've never seen it. Maybe it's just in the States. It was on the Reef Builders website, but I can't remember the brand name. If you do remember, chuck it in the, in the chat. So you could do uh, you could do a sump but for this tank, but probably I would avoid it. Um, other people say you could use an overflow box, which you could, of course. Um, I wouldn't wish drilling in thin, cheaper tanks. So it says uh, Atkins Nature Aquariums. Yeah, it's just a five mil glass. I think it would be so easy to break. I think I agree with you there. Um, hang on overflow to add a sump. Yes, hang on overflow, which is what I'm talking about, basically. Um, so, yeah, so there we go. I don't, don't think there's any other questions, but it would be possible to do it, but I wouldn't bother. And I think if you're going to go down that route, rather than buying this tank, go secondhand and get something like uh, an Aqua One Mini Reef 120, which has a sump, um, or there are various other tanks that come with a sump, um, and you don't have to worry about cracking them. So probably not. Question number eight. This is from MA. Whoop. This is from MA. In a tank like this, is it possible to have more than two fish? Which fish would you would you recommend if you wanted to add anything further? Well, yes, it absolutely is possible to have more than fish in a tank like this. I think in the video I said that I would recommend probably three or four small fish, usually two clownfish. Who doesn't love clownfish? There's a question about clownfish later. I'll come on to them and aggression. Uh, so who doesn't love clownfish? And then something like uh, what I would recommend is what I said in the video, uh, and that is this guy. I think this is called Gurgle from uh, Finding Nemo. Royal Grandma Bassler. They're just so cool, really bright. This photo is a little bit overexposed. They're not quite that bright. Uh, Live Aquaria, trying to jazz it up a bit. Uh, Live Aquaria is a brilliant website, by the way. I'll come on to that in a sec. Um, but so this is what they look like. They're really bright, really uh, cool. They kind of hide in caves, so they're a bit secretive, but they come out loads. So they're cool fish. And I would have something like that. And I would probably have a shrimp goby. The shrimp gobies are the little uh, guys that live in the sand bed and they have a little shrimp with them. Shrimp digs a cave and the uh, the goby keeps watch out. So they work as a team. Really, really cool. Amazing characters. Um, and yeah, that's probably what I would go for. Those four fish, two clowns, a royal grammar and a shrimp goby. With that being said, what I would recommend doesn't really matter. And what you want to do, and this segues onto what I was talking about with Live Aquaria, is you want to find fish that you like, okay? So uh, you want to, there's no point buying the fish that I recommend because you might think they're boring. You might think yellow and purple don't care. Don't want clownfish, everyone's got them. So the best way to do that and kind of the, the start point for your research, and this is what I always use, is liveaquaria.com. It's a website in America. You can buy uh, fish and coral, all that sort of stuff from them. But if you go onto the marine fish section, they then have just about every fish you can get in the hobby, more or less. And they're broken down into all sorts of categories. So you can search by gobies or hawkfish or dotty backs, all sorts of different types of fish. Or even better, they have a category here for nano fish. So then you can look through and see uh, what fish they recommend for nano tanks. Although actually, <laughs> instantly there's a couple of fish I wouldn't put in uh, in this tank. But anyway, it gives you gives you an idea, and you can scroll through this and look at all the fish uh, that would be suitable. In fact, this now these guys are expensive. Hell freaky firefish. They're about 180 quid in the UK, 150 bucks in the states there. Um, but they're really cool. They're beautiful. There's cheaper versions, uh, purple file fish. How much are these? 60 quid, 60 bucks. Um, they would be perfectly suitable. But the, the, the answer really is find out what fish you want. Don't buy what fish other people want. Have a look through this. Find out the fish you want. Make sure you weed out any fish. This is really good as well. So let me have a quick look at this fish. So this is a ruby red dragonet, scarlet dragonet. Um, and there you will see it gives you care level at the bottom. Care level for this guy is difficult. Yeah, damn right it's difficult. They're very tough fish to keep. Uh, so you want to weed out any fish that are particularly tricky or you want to weed out any fish that are particularly aggressive. Semi-aggressive in a tank like that, you might be able to get away with, but um, really you want uh, peaceful fish. Um, but this is the way to do it. Go on Live Aquaria uh, and search around. And you can even buy them from Live Aquaria if you're in the States, of course. Uh, so that is how I would do it. And you can add more than two fish. I would say to aim to, to limit yourself to four fish 
in this 100 litre tank to start with because it doesn't have a lot of filtration. It's really you're relying on the rock and the sand and a small filter, which we'll come on to in a second, uh, plus water changes. So there's not a massive amount of filtration. It doesn't have the capacity to take much bio load, but you could probably get more than that, but build up slowly. The answer really is when you're looking to stock fish, how many fish can you stock depends on is there enough territory for all the fish? Uh, if there are any aggressive fish, you want to rule them out pretty early on uh, because that will, in a small tank, 100 litres, two and a half feet long, uh, an aggressive fish can be a, a recipe for disaster. Uh, so territory aggression you want to look for. Um, what else do you need to look for? So, oh, bio load, of course. So not a massive amount of filtration. You don't want to overload it. Uh, the bacteria won't be able to cope if you chuck in too many. But I think that's you're probably not likely to hit the bio load limit in this tank. More likely is the final point nutrients so if you have 10 fish in that tank even if they're small you're just going to have nitrate and phosphate through the roof which means you'll have algae everywhere so kind of four or five maybe if you were to push it um, is probably about right but just take it really slow keep measuring your nutrients and your nitrate and phosphate uh, every all the time as often as you can once a week is probably enough and uh, just take it slowly and if it's after six months or a year if you've got four fish in there and your nitrate and phosphate isn't shifting and you've got no algae maybe chucking another small fish, another little goby. So can you add more than two fish? Absolutely. How many? How long is a piece of string? Test your nitrates and your phosphates. Uh, let's all bounce back, bounce back, wind back. What have we got uh, in the chat? Any other questions? I'm going to try to catch up with some of these questions, but I'm going to struggle if I'm completely honest, because there's millions already. I've, I've, I'm 100 questions behind. But anyway, uh, someone's saying two lavender tangs, one clown. Two yellow-tailed damsels. Don't know what a lavender tang is. Never heard of that, actually, to be fair. Uh, but I assume that's a banter. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't have two tangs in this. You could probably get away with one small tang in the short term, like a tummy tang, maybe even a, a small coal tang. But you'd need to move them on. And I'd be a little bit concerned about the amount of waste they produce. So, I don't know. But certainly not, um, not long term. Don't think there's any other questions. So there's plenty of people making suggestions um, for fish. We're all good there. So I think we've covered that up. Oh, hang on. We have a super chat. Clockwork chaos. Right. I'm going to try to find you. After a 20-year hiatus, my wife convinced me to do a tank again. A lot has changed. Great content. Thank you for getting me back up to snuff. You are welcome. Welcome back to the hobby. Great to have you back. Um, and I'm glad that... Uh, Do you say your wife has persuaded you? Uh, yes, yes. That is fantastic. Well done for getting your wife on board and well done to her for, for talking you into going back into the hobby. I'll pin your comment when I uh, when I get back to it. But there we go. Thank you for the super chat as well. Very kind of you. So question number nine. How long are we? 38 minutes. Well, I was going to try to keep this to uh, an hour, but that's gone out the window. So <laughs> we'll see how long it goes. Question number nine. Number drummer. Nice video. What about quarantining the fish? Is there a need to do this if the tank is new? This is going to require a sip of beer. Now, certain people in the hobby shout at me when I give my opinions on quarantine. Uh, and I've made two videos explaining my views on quarantine for beginners in particular, but also for me. Now, I don't quarantine fish. Some people will tell you that's Russian roulette. Uh, it's not. That's a ridiculous comparison. Russian roulette means you've got a one in six chance of dying. With quarantine, with not quarantining fish, I don't know what the odds are, but it's I don't know, a thousand to one, a hundred to one, whatever. It's a lot longer. Um, so I don't quarantine fish. I personally prefer to be very choosy with the fish I, I buy, very careful uh, in terms of selection. Don't go for fish. If you go into a fish shop and they don't look well looked after, steer clear of them. If you can find a fish shop you trust and you know they look after fish, especially if they treat properly, then you can uh, you can use that, that as a good source of fish. If you can buy pre-quarantined fish, so much the better. Make sure that they're they're healthy. There's no white spots on them or no marks on them. And there's no white spots on any fish in the shop. If there are, and they're all linked in the same system, walk away, come back another time. Um, make sure they're nice and healthy. They're not too thin. You can always get, you often get small fish uh, that maybe a, a tang that is that big and they're really skinny and they're not likely to survive. Oh, well they're more likely to die in a small tank. So avoid that. And personally, I think um, fish uh, selection is more important and I wouldn't quarantine. Um, but you are running a risk of introducing disease if you if you don't quarantine, it's true, uh, no doubt about it. 
I just think that actually quarantine does more harm than good. And I find for a beginner, and I found when I did quarantine as a beginner, it was really difficult. And I lost more fish in quarantine than I did to disease. And I've never had, touch wood, any major outbreaks. I did lose a couple of fish to white spot in my first ever tank, but the rest of the fish um, survived, despite the fact that I probably should have pulled them all out and quarantined them. I didn't. Um, and I've never had any any nasty breakouts. I did have a, a, a Blenny die of uh, white, or oh, well, he had white spots and he died in my tank, my main tank about, I don't know, two years ago, something like that. No other signs of, uh, of um, white spot on any of uh, any other of my fish. So I got away with it, got away with it. But I also run uh, UV sterilized and all that sort of thing. But um, I don't quarantine. I wouldn't recommend beginners to do so, but do your own research. Uh, look at the pros, look at the cons and make your own mind up. And if you're going to quarantine, then yes, you do need to quarantine your first fish because otherwise you potentially introduce uh, fish disease. And even if you quarantine all the other fish, well, these guys that you put in there first might have that disease and might um, uh, will pass it on. So if you're going to quarantine, yes, do quarantine your first fish. So let me look and see if I'm getting any hate in the comments about uh, <laughs> quarantine. Uh, probably not, actually. No, I think we're all, all right. We're, we're good. But yeah, I got some I got some real stick off my uh, my quarantine videos, but I stand by them to be fair. I don't I don't uh, I, I wasn't wrong. <laughs> so moving on, number ten, tranquil waters, nice video series, but you have uh, but have to disagree with you on adding corals. Those uh, can and probably should be added day one. Now, I posted this quite this comment. Um, he was not the first, the only person to say this. But he was the person who said it in the nicest way. There were a couple of people who were a little bit feisty in the way they said it and saying that it's uh, it's dated to uh, to add cars later. Now, the reason I don't think that it is there, there, there is validity in doing that. And there are some people who, who will do that and will be successful. In fact, I'm a complete hypocrite. On my 150 litre tank that I have next to me, I put corals in probably after a week or two. But the reason I did that is firstly, because they come from my main tank and I have them to spare. So Worst case scenario, if they die, it's not the end of the world. I haven't lost any money and I haven't lost the coral. But more to the point, if they start to go south, I can put them back in the, the main tank and I'll know I'll be able to recover them. But also, I know what to look for. So if one of my corals isn't looking good, I'll be able to spot it straight away. I'll also know why it's not looking good because it doesn't have uh, nutrients. I'll be testing all these sorts of things. So there are all sorts of things that you need to know before you add your first coral. And I just it's just not a good idea until you get your head around things. You can do it, you can add a test of coral. And in theory, you add biodiversity because bacteria comes in on corals, good bacteria and all this sort of stuff. So in theory, it's a good idea. That's what some people say. I just don't agree. And particularly for a beginner, I think you're better off not doing it. In fact, you know, I meant to take a photo today. On the, if you look at the first video, first uh, how to set up a simple sort water tank video, you will see on the piece of live rock, there was a load of algae on it. Just a, a light layer, just kind of a thin film really, but it was green and you could very much see it. On If you put that in a lot of tanks without an algae eating fish, it would go boom, you get green hair algae everywhere. In this tank, it's the tank is three weeks old now, uh, the algae has almost completely died off. And that's because there are no nutrients in there and it's not ready to support uh, photosynthetic life. So if you put a coral in, a coral is more demanding than algae. And if the algae is dying, well, the coral is not going to do any good. So just it's just not a good idea. I, I get why people say it. And again, do your research. Look at the pros and the cons. Decide who you think is uh, uh, fits in with, with your way of doing things. But I just don't think it's a good idea. And corals simply don't do well in a new tank. So there we go. That's my answer to that question. Uh, let's see if anyone else is saying anything on that point in the chat. No, we're all good. Uh, someone's lost fish to quarantine. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, it does. Uh, it does happen. So there we go. That's tranquil waters. And thank you for putting it respectfully. I do appreciate that. So question number 11, Dennis Van Opstal. Awesome and informative video. Thank you, Dennis. Did you leave the filter empty now? Why not put Eheim Substrate Pro in the filter compartment for extra living space for the bacteria? That, Dennis, is an excellent question, and that is exactly why I've put it in the uh, in the video today. So let's bring this back up. Go full screen. Take a sip of talking juice. So the filter is on the right hand side, next to the 
uh, the heater. Now that heater actually, by the way, there's a heater built into the filter, but it just couldn't cope in my cold <laughs> 1915 house in the middle of winter in the UK <laughs> where it's about three degrees. Um, so I put a second uh, heater in to, to keep it going. And even then it only got up to 24 and a half, which is about 76 Fahrenheit. So pretty, uh, pretty chilly. Although it didn't go any lower overnight. I came down at four in the morning a couple of times, still 24 and a half. I digress. So the filter behind it is, um, if you look on the video, on part one of the video, I show you inside the filter. There's all it's got is a little, I don't know, five inch sponge with a bit of um, activated carbon in the middle. And it just, all that does is polish the water, makes it clear. It doesn't do anything for, it doesn't house bacteria. Well, technically it does, but you'll throw it away so they disappear. It doesn't house bacteria. It doesn't do anything to reduce nitrate or phosphate. It just polishes your water. The alternative to that, because there is space in there, is to throw away the, the little activated carbon sponge and put a bit of filter media in there. Dennis, you talk about Eheim Substrate Pro. I don't know what that is. That sounds like it might be a freshwater thing. Um, Eheim, big freshwater company, of course. Uh, I wouldn't use that. I would use Ciparax. And I thought long and hard about putting some Ciparax in that um, tank. Ciparax is just basically, in fact, let me pull it up. So I can show you what it is. Ciporax. It's hula hoops. <laughs> it was from the, the pond world, in fact. It came originally, but it's been hugely popular in um, uh, in marine tanks uh, over recent years. So it's just a filter media. It's here. It is. So there you go. Hula hoops made from sintered glass. It's just got an extremely high uh, surface area, so it's great for colonising bacteria. So absolutely, that's a real option. And I think I probably would chuck out the uh, the polishing sponge and put in bacteria because it just increases your, your bacteria so you've got uh, a better better bioload capacity. So yes, I absolutely would do that. One thing, <laughs> I've just noticed the price on this, £111.99. For a, that's for a 10-litre bucket. That's enormous. You'd only need a small sachet that would cost you 10 quid for this tank. But yes, Dennis, absolutely, I would consider using some kind of filter media in that filter. And I think that would be a better use than the sponge with activated carbon. You can always just plop a bag of activated carbon somewhere behind the rock work out of the way and it'll do the same thing. So, yes, very good idea. That's probably what I would do if I was keeping the tank long term. Let's have a look and uh, see in the chat. Uh, filter Pro. Someone says use Filter Pro, uh, which might be a, a, another filter media. Someone else recommends Max Spect BioBlocks plus one for Ciparax. I think that's it. So, yeah, there we go. So, very much so, I would do that. Thank you for the question, Dennis. Question number 12, SAR life. What kind of lighting schedule would you suggest for a setup like this? I've been on the freshwater side of the hobby for around 15 years at this point, but I'm looking to go salty. Uh, very similar to the, the setup that you, or the lighting schedule you'd likely have on your little freshwater setup. Little sounds, <laughs> that's the wrong word, on your freshwater setup. Um, 12 hours a day, basically, is what you want to build up to. Um, some people go for moonlights, if you've got a more advanced light than uh, than the Tunzi, I wouldn't bother with moonlight. It's a gimmick if you ask me. It doesn't doesn't do anything. Um, there's no benefit. Um, so, yeah, 12 hours a day is what you want to build up to. You want to build up to that, though, slowly. So at one point when you've got your tank up and running completely, you might have it from 10 in the morning to 10 at night. But to start with, if you have it on for 12 hours a day, especially at 100%, you're just going to get a load of algae. So start it at, I don't know, six hours a day and build up very slowly over the course of a month or so, um, and even maybe longer than that. And if you've got a, a light you can control, turn the brightness down to 20% and build that up slowly. Certainly as you add corals, corals will suck up more stuff. So uh, if you're just bumming in, bunging in a load of light without any corals, you're just going to get algae. Uh, whereas when you increase the algae when you've got coral, increase the lights when you've got corals there, at least they'll soak up some of the nutrients. So lighting schedule, you want to end up around 12, well, 12 hours a day and just build up to that very, very slowly. You won't regret going slow with building up the light. But I do turn light on from day one and I've never had any problems as a result of that. Nice quick question. Uh, quick chat in the uh, live stream. All good. Nothing I've missed. So Robert Leffler. Awesome idea using that light. I was guessing you would use an AI Prime, but I've never seen anyone using that Tundee. So... The light I used, and we'll just quickly go back uh, to this. The light I used was a Tunzi 8811. Tunzi, if you watch this video, unlikely, sort out your naming conventions. They're very confusing. But this is the marine eco-chic, it's called as well. 
uh, and it's a really good little light and it's made by uh, a German brand, of course. Good bit of kit. The reason I didn't go for something much better, like an AI Prime, and an AI Prime is undeniably better. If you don't know what an AI Prime is, ooh, look at that. <laughs> Doesn't it look fancy? It's a 250 quid light, whereas the Tunzi is uh, 60 pounds. So it's much, much uh, more expensive, but it is a vastly superior light in just about every way. But the reason I didn't go for this, well, there's a number of reasons. Firstly, it would have made the cost of the tank double <laughs> just from this light alone. Uh, it would have gone from 300 pounds to almost 600. So it was crazy. And I wanted to, wanted to show you this can be done on a budget and still be done well. Um, and also because on the simple salt water tank I've gone for, all right, in this video, in this particular video, it's got the, the lid off, but that's just to show you that it looks cool. The idea with this tank really is to run it with a lid on because it'll stop evaporation um, and make it a bit more, more simple. So if you've got a lid on, you can't put an AI hydron. The AI hydro is designed to sit above the tank. Wouldn't I wouldn't advise putting it under the hood. It's no good. This Tunzi light, obviously, waterproof, completely waterproof. Brilliant. So you don't need to worry about that. But the you'd have to take the lid off. And if you take the lid off, that means you then have to uh, put an auto top off on because fresh water will evaporate, leaving salt behind. So you need to put more fresh water back in as it evaporates. You can do it manually, but it's a complete pain. It'll mean your salinity will swing. You don't want to do it. So you want to buy an auto top off pump, probably 70 quid, maybe a little bit more. Um, and you need a cover because fish will jump out. Clowns especially, they're a nightmare for it. I've uh, lost a damsel fish before I had a cover on my tank that jumped out. I thought it was unlikely to, he jumped. So loads of fish, pretty much every fish in the hobby will jump if there's no cover. So you would have need, I would have needed to spend another hundred pounds getting an auto top off and a, um, a cover. And I would have needed to spend another 200 quid on the light. And it just wasn't worth it in my opinion. But again, the whole point of this was that you can upgrade it. And I'm showing this video with uh, the lid off because I think that looks really cool. It's a rimless look. For a hundred quid tank, 125 pounds, I think that cost. In fact, I bought that tank. I bought that second hand, brand new, unopened, 95 pounds. So for a hundred quid tank, I think that looks amazing. Um, and you could longer term upgrade it when you got a bit more cash. You could upgrade the light to something like the the AI Prime. You could then put your auto top off on when you got a bit more money and a cover as well. And if you've got the AI Prime as well, it does a couple of things completely differently to the Tunzi. So the Tunzi is basically, it's either on or off. <laughs> that, that's your lot. There's no control. There's no ramping up in the morning. So it gives you a nice sunrise and sunset effect. Um, that's it. It's on or off. Whereas with the AI Prime, it's got a sexy little app that you can control. You can control, you can make it so it comes on nice and slow in the morning and goes off nice and slow in the evening. And it gives you this blue fluorescence, which you won't get with the Tunzi. Then it's white lights during the day. It looks really cool. You can adjust the intensity. So you can set it down to so it's 20% when you start it, bump up to 50% when you've got more corals. It's a ton more powerful, much, much more capable light. But I don't think for the application I wanted, I don't think it was a better light. So you would have guessed I would have used the AI Prime. A couple of other people said the same thing. That's why I did budget mainly. And I think actually for, for the light, for what you need for that tank, you, that the Tunzi is great. You do not, and I did see a couple of comments that I didn't post actually that maybe I should have done saying that you absolutely must have a really powerful light and uh, suggesting that it's a bad idea to, to start up a tank like this with a tiny light. It's just not true at all. The light is not going to be your limiting factor. That Tunzi will do the job just fine. I know I've used them personally before in a frag tank. I've grown, I had three of them, mind, um, because I needed a lot of power because I was growing Aquapora corals under them. But Aquapora are the trickiest corals to keep in the hobby. And that Tunzi light can grow Aquapora corals. I've used it for, to do just that. So it's not the light is not going to be the limiting factor. You don't need to spend uh, several hundred pounds or dollars on a light. Uh, are they better? Of course they are, yeah. You get what you pay for. But you don't need it. Uh, and actually, just for soft corals, that Tunzi light is absolutely fine. So no, I don't agree that you need more light. Let's have a quick look at the chat as well, catch up. Nothing I'm missing there. Oh, tons, you can't go wrong with the AI, very versatile, completely agree. It's a really good bit of kit. So lots, lots of love for the AI Prime. Do you know what, the, another thing with the AI Prime, there's a ton, because it's such a popular light, reasonably priced, 
uh, and quite flexible, there are loads available second hand. So you can buy a one that's a year old or two years old for half the price. Um, I've saw a couple of people saying that I shouldn't be encouraging people to buy second hand light as well. Um, and I can't remember if I did encourage people to buy second hand light. It was all new, the equipment I had. But anyway, there's nothing wrong with buying a second hand light. And it's not like a three year old light will suddenly pack up. So, absolutely, if you wanted to expand the, uh, the tank and you had a small budget, uh, a second hand something, uh, second hand AI Prime or something like that would be spot on. So, yeah, 100%, something like that would be wicked. Uh, next question, question number 14. This is from Ananyo Samael. I think I've got that right. Chinese lights are overhated. Now, the reason he's saying this, he or she, is because in my video I said that if you're looking at a budget, the budget end of the hobby, <clears throat> you don't really have many options. Tunzi is the one I went for because it's cheap, but it's a good German brand and known quantity. But if you go for a Chinese light, then they can be a bit of a lottery. So you might get one that's total and utter rubbish, frankly. And in fact, I did a video called I Bought the Cheapest uh, Aquarium LED in the World. Uh, and the lot <laughs> it was 16 pounds it was always going to be bad might have even been eight pounds it was so cheap i can't remember it was always going to be bad but it was properly awful absolutely horrendous and you just you wouldn't you wouldn't want it uh for for a fish tank at all for corals there was a massive hot spot so the par dead underneath it was super super strong which means it would have melted any of your corals and then a couple of inches either side the par was basically zero and i'd question the spectrum the longevity all that sort of stuff so Chinese lights, are, but anyway, the question, question, Chinese lights are overhated. You could have gotten a very good Aquanite Spectra for 60 bucks. It's really not uh, as unreliable, and many people have had a lot of success with it. So this is the thing. Chinese lights are a lottery, and that, what I mean by that is you might get lucky. This Aquanite Spectra, I'd never heard of it, although I think Moki, Inappropriate Reefer, used it for his $150 tank. Um, I personally didn't like the um, uh, a couple of things about it, including the bracket. But um, if that's a, the kind of light that people have had success with, brilliant. Absolutely go for it. And in fact, one thing I would say, I don't hate Chinese lights. Very much do I not hate Chinese lights. So much so that this tank that I've spent a ridiculous amount of money on, I mean, I'd be embarrassed to tell you, this tank is run with Chinese lights. They're called Evergrow uh, IT5012s. And they are fantastic. They cost me, uh, well, actually, they weren't that cheap to go. A thousand quid. But if I'd have spent the, money, the equipment money on Radions, I would have been talking four times that. So they are they are great. I don't hate uh, Chinese lights at all. All I'm saying is that it's a lottery. And if you just go on Amazon or Alibaba, or AliExpress, or whatever, looking for, for uh, aquarium lights and you get cheap stuff from China, eh, you're likely to end up with a duffer. If you do your research, if go on, there's a guy on YouTube called Telegram on Instagram as well, T-E-L-E-G-R-A-H-A-M. He experiments with black box Chinese lights all the time. So he will tell you what the good ones are. And there are good ones out there. So you can do your research. I just think for the money, 60 quid for a Tunzi, you just can't go wrong. Tunzi are a great brand, um, really reliable, good piece of kit. So there we go. I'm sure there is a, a lot of people in the, in the comments talking about that. Uh, someone's just said, aren't you Prestige Reef's boyfriend or something? Uh, no, I'm not, <laughs> but thank you very much. Uh, Aquanite isn't a bad light. There you go. So someone else says Aquanite is good. A couple of people like the Aquanite light as well. So there you go. Some people love uh, Evergrows as well. So there we go. Uh, Aquanite maybe, but and I don't hate Chinese lights at all. I just think that you're probably better avoiding them unless you really do your research. And even then with my lights, the Evergrows, Whilst they're fantastic, they are still very limited. The, the the light underneath them is fantastic, but two inches either side, it drops off massively and there's virtually no power. So you need to, and that's why I've got my entire tank basically is covered in these lights head to toe. Um, and if you didn't do that, it wouldn't work as well. So there, there are limits with them. But I don't hate them. I just think the Tunzi is a really good light for this, uh, this tank. And you could put two Tunzis on it. So you've got loads of power, really good. Anyway, question number 15. <clears throat> How long in do I? We're an hour in. That's good. We're all right. Broken machine. Hi, great vid. Uh, which is the best fish to add first with clownfish? Can a sponge filter be used? Thanks for the enjoyable content. Which is the best fish to uh, add with clownfish? Now, I put this up because uh, I had 
might come onto it later as well. I can't remember if I posted the next question, but some people were talking about clownfish being aggressive um, and suggesting that uh, clownfish will batter any fish that go in after. Clownfish can be aggressive, absolutely. Um, and you can look around, it doesn't take you long looking on forums and on YouTube to find uh, people who have had a, a bad experience with clownfish. On a worst case scenario, you can get to the point where you put your hand in your tank and they'll bite you. <laughs> and not only do they bite you, but they can draw blood on <laughs> really sharp little things. Um, and I've, I've swam, I've done scuba diving in the wild and they come over. I'm six foot tall. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a reasonably big lad compared to a clownfish. They attack me. <laughs> and they try to chase me off. If I get too close. It's hilarious. So they're proper aggressive uh, in a worst case scenario, but almost all clownfish are absolutely fine. And they only really start to get aggressive when they're breeding. And even then I've had my clownfish for four years they always hang out in the same spot. They always uh, try. I've never seen eggs there, but they 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 ready it. I can see they're preparing it for breeding. I pull their the home out, which is a load of zoas, all the time to trim it back. And I got a nibble once. That's about it. They're fine. So don't worry about clownfish being aggressive. It can happen. Be aware that it can happen. But generally, they're they're fine. So which is the best fish to add first with the clownfish? Go back to live aquarium and find the fish you want. But I would go for shrimp goby and a uh, royal grammar can you add a sponge sponge filter uh i suppose so i wouldn't bother um with a sponge filter i would use ciparax instead um people will often say sponge filters are a nitrate factory whether well, that's true i don't know but um i would go for ciparax it's much 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 better and dirt cheap anyway so thank you for the question question number 16 uh i'm just going to catch up with the chat again Slash have an excuse to um, uh, have a sip of beer. I think we're all good. Oh, my clowns killed the shrimp goby. Oh, no, someone's had bad experience. Uh, Rudra, no blood from, uh, but nip for fast and hard. It's like an electric shock. You don't expect it. <laughs> so the only nibble I had was a tiny little nibble that didn't I didn't really feel. But, uh, yeah, it's funny how they're, they're so vicious. But there you go. So some people, it it is a fact that clownfish can be aggressive. I just wouldn't worry about it. Uh, anyway, question number 16, Athelsoni, Unitis. Hi, Alex. I was wondering if keeping zoas or pallies are really dangerous to humans, fish, and inverts. Uh, I've been scared to add zoas to my reef tank for three years, and this is a question I cropped because I ran out of characters, but you were, you were saying that you want me to convince you to get um, zoas. And this question I've put up for a couple of reasons. One, zoas are really likely to be uh, one of your first corals because they look awesome. They glow under blue lights. Um, and they're relatively easy to keep for the most part. Some can be a bit finicky, but for the most part, they're easy to keep. Uh, and the other reason I brought it up is because people often talk about um, palytoxins. So and palytoxin is, is a real thing. So in some zoas and palythoas, basically the same thing, um, you get a, a chemical called palytoxin. It's uh, I don't know if it's the most deadly uh, toxin in the world, but it's one of them. <laughs> you basically you don't want uh, to to be ingesting. You don't want to rub it in your eyes. Basically, it's gonna it's gonna sting. Um, and actually, the worst case scenario I've seen some people have boiled rock. You can buy live rock, of course, for aquariums, and some people have boiled it to get rid of all the life on it. And they've uh, they found that actually there were some zoas on that rock, and it's released palytoxins into the air. And they've been hospitalized as a result. I've never seen people die of it, but you absolutely could. I've seen a, a, a family in the news have their dog uh, hospitalized. I don't think it died, but it can be really nasty stuff. The lesson there is don't boil your rock. <laughs> it was a really, really bad idea. But anyway, I understand why people would do it. So theoretically, yes, zoas can potentially, possibly, in theory, um, be uh, poisonous and, and toxic. Toxic is probably the better word. Um, uh, are they going to cause you any harm? No, they're not. There's just there's just no likelihood. Be aware that it is a theoretical possibility, but you're more likely to get hit by lightning than you are uh, to to have a nasty reaction to any any zoas. I cut. I no, I've never done a video on how to frag zoas because I don't do it in a very responsible way. I slice them up with um, with a razor. Uh, they squirt everywhere. I don't always have goggles on, which is a really bad idea. Um, I pull them off in the tank with my bare hands. My bare hands, like I'm... Uh, uh, I pull them off and sometimes I squeeze them and so they squirt into the water and all that. There's just... It's just... It's not an issue. 
be aware that theoretically it is possible, but don't let that put you off. They're not dangerous. Um, they're not a problem at all. And in fact, even things like um, fox face, fox face fish, really cool fish, have spines on the back that are venomous. And so that puts some people off. They're so peaceful. They're never going to attack you. They're not like clowns. It's nothing to worry about. So no, zoas are absolutely fine. They're not going to harm your fish. They're not going to harm your, your inverts. And they're not going to harm you unless you boil them. And another reason you should buy zoas is because I sell them. So uh, there you go. And I sell them through Ultimate Reef. If you go onto the Ultimate Reef forum, sign up every now and then. I, I put them in the livestock section for on the classifieds. And I do them dirt cheap. And I do big colonies, or not big colonies, huge frags um, that are really established and well settled. So anyway, excuse the uh, the plug. Quick check in the, in the chat to see if we've had anyone die of, uh, uh, of, uh, of poisoning from zoas. He has no fear. C3DPO says, yeah, just, I'm a, basically I'm a double hard bastard. Um, so there we go. So no, uh, no, no one's had any really bad experiences with, uh, with Zoe, so we're all good. Question number 17, Charlie Pullen. Hey, love your videos. Thanks very much. Thinking about going uh, to saltwater from fresh, currently have a four foot dual tank. Uh, can I easily convert this into a marine or should I just start fresh? Pardon the pun. So I actually had a four foot dual tank when I um, was keeping fresh fish and I wanted to go over to uh, salt, the salty side and, excuse me, and that is uh, the exact same uh, consideration I had. I spent oh, untold hours researching, finding people who'd done the same thing, working out how expensive it was going to be, uh, the pros and cons, all this sort of stuff. And I ended up just spending a thousand quid on a dedicated marine tank with a, with a sump. If you've got the budget, then go for a, a dedicated marine tank, especially if you can stretch to one with a sump. It just gives you so much more flexibility with filtration and all sorts of other things that help corals. So if you can, if you can afford it, a tank with a sump and a dedicated marine setup is just so good and so much better than converting a freshwater setup. But can you convert it? Absolutely. The tank that I um, based this entire video series, two video series, so not really a series, but the tank I based this video on is a freshwater tank. It's uh, it's from Tetra, freshwater company. Uh, I emailed them, asked them about it. They were cool. They said, yeah, it's fine. Uh, it is a freshwater tank. You can do it. It's possible. You could do it with, I don't know what dual tank this guy had. Um, if you've got no lid, then of course you've got evaporation to figure out and a lid to figure out. But that would also mean that you can put a skimmer on it. You can use a canister filter. I personally wouldn't, um, but there are people who've had success with it. Do your research. But yeah, you absolutely can. It would be limited in the same way that this is limited. Uh, but yeah, you can do it. So if you want to dip your toe in the water without spending too much money, drain your uh, your fresh water out, take your fish back or sell them, take them back to your local fish shop and have a crack. Why not? And then you, you're you not going to lose too much money. So yeah, you absolutely can do it. And I wanted to post that question because I think that's probably something that a lot of people think. So the answer is, why not? Give it a crack. No reason not to. But if you've got the cash, do it properly. You'll, you won't regret it. Question number 18. Uh, and I'm just scrolling back through the, the chat to make sure I've not missed anything. Uh, Fish Palace Paul, fellow YouTuber, hates clownfish. He'd <laughs> never buy them again. They've destroyed hammers. Yeah, they can sometimes uh, treat a coral like, a, uh, like an anemone. Only anemones can take a bit of rough and tumble, and not all corals can. Mine are in zoas, and they're fine. But they can uh, they can uh, they can harm so uh, goni goni pora corals and hammer corals torch corals that sort of thing. Anyway, sorry for your loss, Paul. Uh, Neil Edwards, awesome stuff. Would you recommend a random flow generator? Neil Edwards, I would not recommend a random flow generator personally. Uh, what is a random flow generator? I hear you cry. A random flow generator is this bad boy. So it's a tiny little nozzle, probably an inch long or two inches long at the most that sits on a, an outlet for a return pump generally. Um, you can get them all sorts of different sizes, so it can uh, sit on pretty much any tank, and it will disperse flow in different ways. So a normal nozzle is just a tube, so it's an enclosed tube, basically. Uh, I've got a load of piping I was going to show you, but it's too big, but it's just an enclosed tube, that's it. Whereas with this, it is a, a tube with some slits on the side, that you might be able to see there. So it sucks in water halfway up the tube and it's got these kind of fins and fans on the, on the inside that spin the water. So in theory, it kind of creates vortices and it pulls in water from 
general uh, from other directions and blows it out all over the place. So the theory is it turns a straight pump that just goes bomb like that and goes all the time into a bit more random flow. It generates random flow. Um, I've had a couple of these and I just personally, I never really got on with them. They're, I, I didn't really find, find they did much. So if you're using that instead of a power head and you're thinking, can I get away with it instead of a power head? Probably the answer is no. Does it do any harm? No, absolutely not. And if that's the only option you've got, if it's a small tank, then give it a crack. Why not? But it, it's not a substitute for a proper power head. And personally, I wouldn't bother spending the money on it. Um, but it's absolutely got its uses. And I'm sure there will be people in the chat who swear by them and say they're, say they're great. So personally, I wouldn't bother with a random flow generator, but they're not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, I just realized the next question I didn't number properly. I numbered all of these. So this should be number 19, but it's not. Anyway, uh, Steve Hyman asks, I don't see why distilled water would be a problem as its TDS is close to zero. So this was on my cycling video, the third video in the series that wasn't really in the series, but kind of was. Uh, and I said, just use REDI water, not tap water and not distilled water. Now distilled water doesn't really get used much in the UK. I did a bit of research before the video and found a few people in America that use it. But it, it's not really commonly used in the UK. So maybe you're better off asking um, uh, an American forum or something. But the, the reason I said don't use tap water, just don't use it at all. No debate about that. Oh, well, there probably will be some people who will argue, but they're wrong. <laughs> uh, distilled water. If you can find me 100 people who've, who use distilled water and have tanks that you would aspire to, then I will change mine. So yeah, fine, do it. But uh, I've never seen anyone run distilled water with a tank that I aspire to. Whereas all the people I aspire to, myself uh, and anybody else I know who's had a, a decent tank, uses RODI water. It's just one of those things that I'm sure you could research it endlessly. Just accept it. RODI is better. Full stop. Question number 19. Brad was here 101. Was here 101. Uh, when do you turn a protein skimmer or algae reactor on? Great video. So, this was a really commonly asked question. Brad, uh, you were not the only person to ask this question. When do you turn it on? So this, and the idea of this is you've set up your new tank. Uh, this tank in particular, the one that I've run up, doesn't have a, a protein skimmer. But if you did have a protein skimmer or an algae filter, any kind of filter, at what point would you turn it on? Turn it on day one or do you turn it on after a month? And now all my tanks that I've set up, I reckon, I couldn't, couldn't tell you for sure, but I think I probably turn them on from day one on almost all of the tanks, certainly in the first week. Um, but the answer really is if you're adding bottled bacteria, you want to turn the, the skimmers and your filters off for probably a couple of days, three or four days to be safe. You'd probably get away with 24 hours to be fair, but um, three, a few days to let the bacteria settle and stick onto the rocks and the sand, all that, so it doesn't just get sucked out. Um, but why, when would you want to turn uh, your filters on aside from that? assuming that all your bacteria are nicely stuck to, to surface areas, probably wouldn't hurt to leave it for a few weeks, a month maybe, to let some nutrients build up. Because if you turn a skimmer on day one, it's not going to be pulling anything out because there's nothing in there. And it wouldn't hurt. Well, it's a good thing to have some nutrients in the tank. So simple answer to that, probably after a month. Long answer, keep testing your nitrate and your phosphate. And when you've got some kind of detectable levels, bang them on. Question number 22. In fact, let's just have a quick look. Um, oh, to someone, Atkins Nature Aquariums, you have 18 TDS from the tap. That is amazing. Yeah, someone's asking if you live in Norway. And you say, uh, uh, yeah, and I, so there are some people, I can't remember if I said this, I'm sure I've said this in a video. Anyway, uh, people, some people live in uh, the Lake District or Scotland, where water is uh, much nicer than down south, where I live. My TDS is 350 parts per million, which is filth, basically. You want zero parts per million, uh, and that's what I use. I never, if, I, if my TDS went up to one part per million, I'd throw it away. I only want zero. Um, so, but if you have tap water that's 18, that's still higher than I would like, to be honest, but I'd be a lot more comfortable using that tap water than my filth. Um, in someone saying the C3DPO 486, Northwest America. There you go. So there are some people who have very low um, TDS uh, from the tap. I still wouldn't, it's going through copper pipes. I still wouldn't want it personally, but 18 TDS, pretty solid, not bad. 
Question number 21, and we're, we're coming to the end of the question, so I'll try to catch up with the chat, although I've missed, uh, I don't know. Well, it says I've got 300, 321 comments to catch up with, so I'm not going to hold my breath. Question number 21, JH, uh, why do you uh, do such regular water changes? I recommended 10% uh, or 10 to 20% once a week. I thought if you had a good enough skimmer and auto-dose daily, this minimizes water change. I didn't know what he meant by auto dose daily, but anyway, um, there's no skimmer on this tank, and that's why I recommend 10% uh, water. Or one of the reasons I recommend water changes. But even if you have a good skimmer, great filtration, the water changes is another thing you can research till your heart's content. You can find people who have amazing tanks who don't do water changes and say, ah, it's not necessary because you can pull out your bad things other ways that are more effective, and you can replace the good things other ways that are more effective. Yeah, it's possible, but I tell you what, the, and BRS always say this, the, the number of people who have success doing water changes versus the number of people who don't have success because they're not doing water changes is huge. So just do water changes. I recommend on this tank because there is no skimmer. There is no filter that pulls things out. There are, there's filtration that will provide bioload and a space for the bacteria to live, but there's nothing really that's going to process uh, your, your your nitrate and reduce it and your phosphate. So that's one of the main reasons. But also on any tank, I always do 10% uh, a week, every week, um, and just without fail. I'm, there, I'm sure there'll be people in the chat right now who are saying, oh, I've been running without water changes and it's fantastic and all that sort of stuff. As a beginner, just do them. Just do them. This is my tank. I do 10% water changes a week. If that's the sort of tank that you want to aspire to, and you can see that... Um, that 10% water changes does good. That's not the only thing, of course. There's a million things that go into it, but just do it. What If you want my advice anyway, if you want to follow anyone else's advice, that's fine, but water changes, just do them um, uh, all the time. Don't stop. Even if you get six months in and you're thinking, everything's fine. I don't need to do stop. I don't need to carry on with water changes. Yeah, you do. <laughs> everything's probably fine because, in part because you're doing water changes. Just don't stop ever. So there we go. Question 21. And we're coming to the end, so I'll try to catch up with the chat. Question 22, El Final. Pull T. I've read clowns can be territorial. I've answered that already. Can any fish be used for this method? For example, a goby or fire fish, or should you go fishless cycle method with less hardy fish first? So this was on the how to cycle a, a, a saltwater aquarium video. Um, so the, the question basically is, should you, uh, if you're not using clownfish, should you use a different cycle method? No, it doesn't matter what fish you use. I am not the method I use does not assume that you have um, hardy fish that can tolerate ammonia. Ammonia is horrible, horrible stuff, and it's torture to fish to, to keep them in ammonia. So I wouldn't keep the, the hardiest fish in the world in ammonia. It's horrible. So it doesn't matter. You shouldn't have ammonia the way I do things. Doesn't mean you won't, things can go wrong, but you shouldn't. So you should be able to use any fish. Clowns are probably the best bet because realistically, they are still damsel fish and they are quite hardy. So if you do have, if the bacteria doesn't settle for whatever reason or you don't put enough in or something goes wrong, you overfeed, which is easy to do, then clownfish are going to be able to tolerate ammonia better than uh, something like a, a firefish, for example, which is quite a delicate fish. So that's part of the reason clowns are, are a really good idea as your first fish. Um, but in theory, it shouldn't matter. But clowns are awesome. Uh, always go for clowns. Right. That, I think, is the, the final question there. We are now up to 335 comments that I've missed. So I'm going to apologize for uh, uh, for the uh, for the lack of uh, going into detail in questions. In fact, I've got a couple of others questions. I'll have a look at this. Let me get rid of that, um, that question there. I'll have a look at my, um, uh, my, my questions here as well, because I did have a couple of other questions that came in before I started this video. I didn't have uh, time to, uh, to to post up on here. Um, someone's just asking, by the way, Greg Malaro, what percentage water change would you recommend? For the tank that I set up, at least 10% a week, 20% a week probably wouldn't hurt. But generally, 10% a week is absolutely fine. Um, but if you have no other filtration, 20% is probably not a bad idea. It's a good way of, uh, of, of removing uh, bad stuff. Right. There are a couple of other uh, questions that I'm going to go through that, that I pulled up earlier. In fact, I don't know if there is. Do you know what? I've answered that. I've answered that. 
we're all good. I'm not. I'm not going to go through those questions. We're going to catch up with the chat. Hello, welcome. Uh, who else have we got? <laughs> oh no, Michael Butler, you've gone controversial. Have you used the spotless machine in Croydon, Alex? Uh, no, I haven't. I've never used spotless water. Spotless water uh, is a company that uh, produces mass produces. I think RODI water. R O R O D I. One of the two. Uh, I would never use it. It's uh, it's for washing cars, uh, uh, and it's a it's a hot topic. Some people love it. Some people hate it. I don't really have an opinion. I don't really live very near Croydon anyway. Uh, I do live in Surrey, but I live uh, the other end. So no, I've never used it, and I would never use uh, uh, spotless. That being said, I would never use anybody else's water. I don't trust anybody, no matter how good the shop is. There, there are some really good shops near me, uh, Reef Dreams in Winchester, AAC in Harlow. And I, to be fair, I probably would trust their water, but I, I don't use their water. I only trust myself because I know exactly I've got control over my water. So I know my water is mm, zero TDS. It's perfect. I don't trust anybody else to to produce my water for me. So no, I would not use that. <clears throat> uh, oh, no, that was the wrong one. This gets asked occasionally. Blinky Fish, do you still use your Refloat Auto Water Changer? I do. A Refloat Auto Water Changer is not appropriate for a small tank. You don't need it. It takes 10 minutes. But for my main tank, which is uh, ruddy enormous, and it takes a 50 litre water change every week, I use that every week without fail. In fact, it's running as we speak. Uh, I probably need to unplug it. How long has it been? Two and, hour, two and a quarter hours. So it's done. I use it every week. It's fantastic. It makes life easy. And that's the way to do water changes. It's find ways to make them easy because they're a pain in the ass, <laughs> and you can easily uh, get tired of them. So find ways to make them easy. Uh, who else have we got? Alex, you are designing an exhibit for an aquarium that you want to be both show-stopping for the general public and appealing, appealing to the hobbyist. Tell us your stock list. Ooh, yeah, exhibit for an aquarium, uh, show-stopping. Uh, how big is it, Paul? Because um, if I've got a lot of space to play with and if I'm not worried about corals, then my answer is going to be different. I'd have angelfish and butterfly fish. Uh, gold flake angelfish are amazing. I'd love one of those. So if I didn't have corals, I'd have a gold flake angel. I'd have a yellow long nose butterfly. I'd have a, a flame angel. Oh, man, I'd go crazy. <laughs> um, okay, let's see if we can catch up with um, some other comments. To, to be honest, I think I don't have many other comments about these videos. If I have missed them uh, and I've not got to you in the chat, put them in the actual comments section of the video, not the chat, put them in the comments, and I'll get to them later. I've had a ton of comments. I'm not quite caught up with everything, but I will get to it. Um, so if I've missed you, all is not lost. But let's have a look. Um, Alex L, right. Um, oh, he's disappeared. There it is. Alex L, I wanted to ask you about your experience with GHL KH Director. Is it worth it? I'm trying to decide between the KH Director and the KH Guardian. So if you're a beginner, you've got no idea what these are about. These test alkalinity, which is a really important parameter, automatically. All you need to know about my experience with the KH Director is on my videos. I think I've probably made two or th maybe three videos about it. I didn't get on with it at all. I, I held back in the videos. I really didn't like it. The software was really clunky and it's changed now. But for the first four years it was out, it didn't send you a notification if, um, the, if, the, if your alkalinity was off. So if it recorded an alkalinity of six and you want it to be nine and you've had a massive crash, it doesn't tell you unless you log into the app. That's changed now, and I think they do have notifications, but I just I hated that about it. So, such a poor decision. Why not put notifications in? So I didn't like it. The software is really bad, and I've now got a, a KH Keeper by Refactory. Software is brilliant, um, and I really like it. I've got two. I've got the Plus and the Standard one. The Standard one's a bit fiddly because it's quite small, and the PH Pro isn't, isn't that great, but the Plus is brilliant, really good. I was giving them to free, for free, so I'm bound to say that, but I promise they're good. KH uh, Guardian, I have no experience with. Um, I think there's probably a reason it's not that popular. The Alcatronic is another one. It's massive, <laughs> and I don't have the space for it, but the components are, are really good quality, so that's worth considering. But if you want a recommendation, um, I would go for uh, the KH Keeper from Refactory because it's just the app is just... It's so much better than anything else out there in the in the hobby. Uh, let's have a look. What else have we got? Canister filters. 
Uh, yeah, 100% agree. You can. Uh, there's something about, yeah, well, you're giving advice there. Bandit angels are stunning, but dollars. Yeah, I think, Atkins, I think they are uh, Hawaiian and therefore no longer available, although they're probably, they might well be captive bred. But uh, bandit angels, for those of you who don't know, are, uh, they have white bodies, bandit angel fish with a, a bandit streak across their um, their eyes and their body. So let me see if I can pull up a photo. This just look at this. Look at this. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> you want that, don't you? I'd love one of these. They're so cool. Um, that's a really good photo. Actually, I hate it when people handle fish like this. It's just so unnecessary. But anyway, uh, yeah. When that when that loads, bandit angels are just look at that. That's just so pretty. But I'd never have it in a um, in a reef tank because it would probably nibble corals. You see them in reef tanks, uh, but I think they're just they're with people who tolerate um, them nibbling at their corals because they're so beautiful. Um, but yeah, seriously cool fish. Uh, got a lot of time for that. Uh, and there we go. I think that's that's pretty much it. New comments. Let's go down. Oh no 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 no. I, I take it back. Uh, we got some comments on GHL. <clears throat> GHL, uh, ask anyone with long-term use of it. Apex is the move if you want a headache-free controller. Trust. Uh, I, I, mm, a, a, uh, Apex doesn't appeal to me, really. I kind of like the idea of trying it, but it looks quite complicated. And anyway, uh, right, someone wants my opinion. Oh, Reef the Sea Forever. I have a lemon peel angel in an SPS reef. I would bet money he nibbles corals, nibbles your polyps. They are one of the worst, <laughs> from what I understand. But they are so stunning. I mean, that is a that's a dream fish. If I had a fish only tank, one of those guys would be uh, would be would be in it. They're amazing. All right, Kaz. Hey, mate. What's your opinion on a Nias Opus 120 and Reef Map 500 for a Red Sea Reefer 250? Would love your opinion. Nias Opus 120, I think, is a tank. Right, that's the one that's sort of sunk down a little bit, so you can't see the bottom. Nias Opus 120. Mm. Yeah, it is. That's a tank. I think you might mean the Nias Quantum 120, in which case, and I'll see if you've just commented to correct me, but I think you mean the Nias Quantum 120, which is a skimmer. I had one. Uh, it's fine. Good good quality, good build quality, but I just found the problem with it, any time, if you, if you look at the sump wrong, or if you touch the sump, <laughs> if you put a different kind of food in, it goes crazy. It starts overflowing. And adjusting it was an absolute nightmare. So I didn't ever really get on with it. And I got the 160, the one up, for my main tank. Um, but uh, I ended up getting rid of that as well because it got really loud over time. And no matter how carefully I cleaned it and reassembled it, it was buzzing. So I don't like it. So I don't I don't like them anymore. There are loads of people have great success with them, so not knocking them as such. Um, but what I would say is... Uh, uh, my personal favorite uh, skim is a Deltex. Deltex. I have a Deltex 600i. Mm, God, it's good. <laughs> it's so good. It's, the build quality is awful. It's really, like, if you scratch the plastic and tap it, it feels like it goes to about two quid to put together. And it's got a Jekod pump. Um, nothing wrong with Jekod, by the way. I use loads of them. Um, but it's not good. It's not high quality uh, build stuff. It's not high build quality. It's not made of the finest materials like the NIOS is. But my God, it's a good skimmer. It's dead quiet. It's so easy to adjust. So, so easy to adjust. It never goes crazy. If the water level's too high, you can dial it back really easily. It's got overflow protection. It's got a really small footprint. Oh, it's wicked. <laughs> it's so good. Um, the only thing I think I'd replace it with is a, a Bubble King. But they're like a million quid. So, uh, yeah. So if you want a recommendation, Dell Tech are just they're so good. I've done a, I did, I think it was like a first impressions review of it, but I've watched that back recently thinking I might do a long-term review. I've got nothing to add. It's great. Uh, so there we go. So that's my, um, that's my thoughts on uh, those particular skimmers. Uh, what else have we got? Six, oh, six line mass. Someone's got a six line mass. Uh, Someone's talking about Hydros uh, with Master Tonic. A Master Tonic. Uh, Hydros looks really interesting. It's not out here in the UK as yet. Um, I don't really feel like a, a controller man myself, um, but that looks interesting. I'm, I'm interested to see how that comes across over here. Uh, you are welcome, Alex L. Oh, Alex L. I sold a coral to someone called Alex L 
who had a Red Sea Reefer 450 about three years ago, no, probably five years ago, and I met you at Waterloo Station. If that was you, hello, I hope they did all right. <laughs> uh, Bandit Angels are lovely. Ah, oh, amen. They're just so cool. Um, what does your wife think about your love of the hobby? So I'm not actually married. She's just my girlfriend. I just call her Mrs. Reef Talk because it's easy. Um, but she she's all right with it. She's really, really supportive of it. Um, I've got a tank in my office, which to get sign off for that was was quality. Um, she, yeah, she's great. She's uh, very supportive of it and she enjoys it. Whenever we're in a fish shop and she chooses a fish and she says, I want you to get that one. It's always one that eats corals and she thinks I uh, <laughs> make it up just to top her having away. But no, she's great. Um, and actually, do you know what? There's so many people have partners in this hobby who are really supportive and it's wicked. Uh, Apex is easy, someone says. Someone says hashtag reef tax, C3DPO. It's a lot of reef tax on um, certain products. Uh, and particularly at the moment, um, Evergrow. So the lights I have, they keep going up and up in price. Maybe it's because of the price of a, a shipping container since COVID and all this, but expensive now a couple of years ago they were half the price they are now a lot of reef tax on that um but anyway so yes yeah kaz you were talking about the um the, the nice quantum 120 so they oh yeah reef the sea forever i am the controller i think that's what jake um uh, adams says yeah exactly right you are the controller i control what goes on in my tank i love having equipment that tells me what's going on but i'm the one who makes the decisions i am the one who cooks so there we go. Uh, wife wants a porcupine puffer so bad. Yeah, I would love one of those. My missus would love one of those. Um, but yeah, not going to happen. <laughs> uh, what are your guests' reaction to your tank? Are they intimidated or interested? Uh, so interested for sure. Friends who know me always, they've come over and spend 20 minutes looking at it. And I, I try to, one of the things I, I try to do with, with the tank, oh, and I've taken the video away so I can't show you. But one of the, one of the kind of the, the, the fish stocking plans was I wanted to have it so you've got loads of fish around about swimming all the time. So you walk in and you go, oh, cool, clownfish. Oh, what's that? That's bright and yellow, all that. But really importantly, I wanted a ton of fish as well that are a lot more secretive. So i.e., and not just fish, like uh, starfish and all this sort of stuff, i.e., and I will bring the tank up as well, um, things like uh, a geometric pygmy perchlet, um, even the royal grammar a little bit secretive and fish that will hide and that you can watch the tank for 20 minutes or so and go and then you go, oh, look, at, oh, look at that have you seen this guy so i have quite a few fish like that and they do that people they're like oh look at that and it's really cool so people yeah people tend to love it um guests who are just kind of passing and not really into fish think it's cool but um i don't know i think you've got to be uh You've got to love it. <laughs> You've got to love the hobby to, to really be into it. So there you go. Uh, so there's a recommendation for a reef octopus skimmer or BBL. BBL. Don't know what BBL is. Reef octopus uh, I did look at, but they don't, or they didn't when I looked at them, they didn't have, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, a DC pump. So I dismissed them because I thought they would be noisy. So, but maybe. BBK, I think you're talking about. Someone else says BBK. Or oh, Bubble King. Yeah. Oh, my Bubble King skimmers. They're just <laughs> they're wicked. Um, no, wrong Alex L. You're not Alex L. All right, never mind. <laughs> it was worth a shot. Uh, okay, so, oh, Silver Phantom. We have someone who set up his first uh, saltwater tank. Hello, welcome. Just set up my first saltwater tank, and it's in the process of cycling right now. Wicked. I'm thinking about adding a Gobi, or a Gobi pistol shrimp pair, uh, but I'm not sure what cleanup crew are safe to keep. If you mean safe to keep with the Gobi and pistol shrimp, you don't have to worry about them. They, technically, there is a possible risk that they might harm uh, other uh, fish or cleanup crew, but it's like with Zoas, it's not. There's, there's not really anything to worry about. I've had, uh, oh, I don't know. I must. Have, I've had a few uh, uh, cleaning the shrimp. Uh, cleaning the shrimp. Pistol shrimp, goby pears, they've never, they just, they look after themselves. They're not interested in fighting. If they were attacked, they would fight back, but they just, it just doesn't happen. If you're in a very, if you've got a very small tank, it's a higher possibility. But even, uh, what's the Canadian reefer, French Canadian reefer on YouTube? Um, Aqua Splendor, he has a very small tank, probably 50 liters or less. Um, and he has a, a shrimp goby in there that doesn't bother anyone. They're really peaceful. You've got nothing to worry about. Put whatever other uh, inverts you want in there, and they'll be fine. 
I'd be more worried about uh, other inverts like uh, the arrow crabs um, or shrimp, like the fire shrimp, uh, supposedly a bit nasty. Clean the shrimp, you can't go wrong with. But yeah, don't worry about the um, the, the the shrimp goby there. They'll be fine. You might find some stories, I suppose. I've never seen any online. You might find some stories, but uh, yeah. Anyway, so what else have we got? What light would you recommend? Here we go. Craps Sebastian. What light would you recommend to keep a mixed reef SPS LPS hybrid? Oh, hang on. <laughs> Let's get rid of that. Hybrid, uh, uh, full LED, T5, and which one? Uh, so, uh, so many options. Depends on your tank size, all this sort of thing. Depends what you want. So this thing, one thing here, right? There's no such thing as the best light in the hobby, in my opinion. Radions are the most popular, but they're not the best necessarily. They are very good at certain things, not so good at others. Personally, for that, uh, I would go for a hybrid T5 LED with Kessels uh, because Kessels just the, just look so good. I want to go back to Kessels. Uh, they look amazing. They, they just the color is so good and the shimmer is spectacular. Some people don't like the shimmer though. Um, some people prefer other shimmer. So. Uh, I don't know. I would go Kessels and maybe a T5 uh, hybrid, but T5 hybrids are quite ugly, quite cumbersome. Doesn't bother me personally, but might bother some. Um, so loads of options, but I would go for Kessels with, with T5s, and it's probably the one, um, <clears throat> probably what I it's what I want to go back to. <laughs> I just love Kessels so much. Uh, right, what else have we got? And someone else is talking about budget. Which fish do you recommend for beginners, Luke? Uh, Lulke says. Uh, oh, clownfish. <laughs> Good. Just the best thing to do, though, is, is not, not listen to what fish I recommend as such. Go and find fish. Go on Live Aquary. Go on the beginner-friendly section and check them out. Find a list of fish that, um, that you like because there's no point buying fish that other people like. You'll get bored of them. Um, clownfish are great, though, uh, and... Uh, one of those royal grammars are wicked, shrimp gobies are wicked. Uh, there's like there's just too many to list. Go on the live aquarium. Uh, Kenny Mac, do you miss your Kessel? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I've got Kessels back actually. I took it, I used to have an Orphic bar down the middle of my Evergreens. I sold that and replaced it with uh, Kessels because I wanted the shimmer back. But they're the old A360 WEs and the color, color is great, but it's not quite the way I like it. And they're not really powerful enough. I get a bit of shimmer in the morning, but they get overpowered during the day. Um, so, yeah, but I do. I love shimmer. I, I love Kessel. Um, thank you so much for actually answering my questions. I didn't even expect you to see my comment. Jimmy, frankly, you're lucky because there's been, I don't know, five, 600 comments. <laughs> I've answered like two of them. So, uh, yeah, C3DPO seen this before. Don't get Alex started on the shimmer of Kessels. I'll, I'll talk for hours. All I do is just, I'm a fanboy. I'm afraid. Yeah, I love them. Uh, people love nature. Yeah, they do. That is that is very true. People do love nature. Or good people love nature anyway. Um, right. So here's some uh, experience on shrimp gobies. Leaves the cleanup crew alone. I have hermits and snails. They're absolutely fine. It's just it's not in the slightest bit of something to worry about. Justin Rigby, you are a motorbiker. What bike is that? Looks like a maybe a 90s Japanese uh, bike. Very nice, very cool. I like bikes. Uh, hi, Alex. Can you have too much flow in a Red Sea Reef for 200 XL? Uh, please can you suggest yes, wave makers and positions. Uh, you can have too much flow, but it's quite difficult. Depends what cars you want to keep. If you just want uh, LPS uh, and softies, something like a couple of Nero 5s would be okay. Uh, AI Nero 5s. Uh, I wouldn't personally go for the Vortec MP10s. The MP40s are really good. The MP10s are a little bit noisier in my experience. So if you've got the budget, two MP40s would be amazing for that tank. You'd probably have to turn them down. But again, it depends on what um, what cars you've got. If you've got SPS corals, you definitely want MP40s. Um, if you haven't, you just, you're just LPS, a couple of AI Nero 5s would be good. For reference, I have a, uh, uh, what's it called? A Waterbox uh, Frag 55.2, which is a bit smaller than your tank. I have two Nero 5s on it at the moment. I've just bought another two today, partly because I only run them at 50% because they're in my office, so they need to be quiet, but also because I like a lot of flow. So uh, you can't have, you can have too much flow, but you, you, you'd go some to, to have too much flow 
for SPS corals. LPS corals don't like so much flow. Um, so a couple of Nero fives maybe. And positions, just the, the, the short answer is probably opposite each other, roughly, maybe slightly offset. But really the best answer is a bit of a pain in the ass answer, to be honest. <laughs> Move them around until you find a, a setup that means that you don't have dead spots. So if you've got food settling in the corner of your tank, you don't want that. So angle it, move it, and make sure you've got um, uh, movement all over the place. In fact, for that reason, four Nero threes would be probably better, maybe. Um, but yeah, there we go. So uh, Brimac loves his uh, Kessel T5 hybrid. Yeah, man. Uh, so what else have we got? Right. Beginner question. Michael Ross. Uh, I'm trying... I, I, Really, I intended this to be all beginner questions. We're getting sidetracked, but, you know, whatever. Uh, everyone likes talking about fish, right? Michael Ross, I'm cycling my first sort of fish tank. My ammonia reached, reached zero, but nitrite is still purple and high. Should I wait a bit lo longer before fish? Yes, you should. Um, someone did comment on my uh, one of my videos, my cycling video, saying that nitrite is harmless to saltwater fish. Not sure that's true. I think it probably isn't. Maybe it is. I don't know. But, yeah, absolutely wait till nitrite is zero. Do not do it. Uh, wait until it is zero. Shouldn't, in theory, take long. But just keep testing. <laughs> uh, I know it's a pain in the ass, but uh, you know, whatever. Uh, mostly SPS. I think this was the... Yeah, yeah, you're, you're the biker. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, mostly SPS, uh, in which case I would get the more the better. Two AI uh, MP40s would not be too much. They're expensive, but they're... And you can't angle them, so that's a bit of a pain. But you can just whip out the uh, the wet sides and uh, clean them and replace them with wet sides that you can replace. I think they're eighty quid a replacement wet side, so they're really easy to maintain. Um, they're just they're just good. <laughs> they're really good. And there's no there's no cables in the tank, so that's what I would go for. I wouldn't go for gyres because you have to. They're very very good, but they you need to clean them all the time. So that's what I would go for personally. But the Nero fives are are also good. Nowhere near as powerful as a uh, an MP40 though. Uh, what else have we got? Also, thanks for responding to my questions. Silver Phantom, you are welcome. Uh, what else have we got? HCB, AI Nero 3, amazing as well. Do you know what, Rudra? I had a Nero 3, and I intended to do a review on it, but I bought it, so I was under no obligation to do so, and I decided against it in the end. But I found them really quite underpowered. Um, and even the Nero 5s, they're not mega powerful, but they're, they're much, much better. But I, they're, for a small tank, they're wicked, the Nero 3. Um, but I expected them to be good on a 150-litre tank, and I was mistaken. <laughs> or good for my purposes, anyway. But they're really small, yeah. And I, I do like the Neros, but... Uh, what else have we got? Uh, someone else has a Nero 3, Atkins. Yep. Yeah. The man with the good quality uh, TDS. <laughs> good quality tap water. Uh, other people love the uh, Nero 3s. Can you shout out me? Vicky Sky... What's going on? How you doing? Welcome to the show. Yes, I can. Shout out to Vicky. Um, oh, Barbara, you're bringing up a, a sad story here. Um, where is your Nokia ras? I've not predictive text or something. Naoko. Well, I've been corrected. It's Naoko, I think, because it's Japanese. My Naoko ras has died, unfortunately. He was he was the one fish that I got so many comments about. Every like every now and then I'd go back and uh, I'd get a comment on a video that was two years old and someone would say, what's the fish at two minutes 34 or whatever? I didn't even need to click on it. I knew it was the Naoko Ras. Um, he died. Uh, he got bullied to death by, oh, what was it? I can't remember now. I think it might have been one of my, my tang, my purple tang maybe. I, don't, I, I forget, but he got bullied to death and I couldn't catch him. I then added a Makoska's Flasher Ras, similar fairy Ras as well. Um, and that got bullied to death as well. Uh, <clears throat> maybe I should have realized it was fairy rasses, but now I know it was fairy rasses because they, they kind of quite flashy and showy. This was the way it was explained to me. They're flashy and showy and they show off their fins. Other fish don't like it, puts them out of shape. So they got kind of um, got done over. <laughs> I actually had a um, koi ras, uh, a solon, red-headed solon ras is a better name for it, uh, who also got bullied to death years ago now by my harlequin tusk fish. Um, and that was really sad to see, and I couldn't catch, I couldn't catch him, so I couldn't save him. So yeah, uh, he's dead, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. 
Um, how long do you have fishes? I don't really understand the question. How, oh, as in how long do they live? Uh, clownfish can live 30 years. Uh, if your clownfish are dying after a couple of years, you're doing something wrong. So they can live 30 years. But uh, other fi fish lifespan varies massively because really fish is a bad name for so many different animals. They're so totally different. You shouldn't really call them all fish. But anyway, Midas plenty. I had a Midas plenty that died about four years old. That is roughly its life expectancy, three to five years old. Um, is what I uh, is what I understand. So they vary hugely. Corals, in theory, can live forever, but uh, they can live. Most fish, I would say, will probably have the potential to live for twenty years plus. So, how much do you want your fish tank? <laughs> uh, any thoughts on gyres for flow? I've just given my thoughts on gyres for flow. Uh, they're they're fantastic for for flow, but they just need cleaning all the time, and. Pfft, I am not about that life. Ooh, oh, I was in a prettier Iris VR 1000, mate. Ah, oh, I do like a prettier. I love an Iris V or oh, a Tuono, sorry. Anyway, I'm isolating 99% of the, uh, <laughs> the chat, so we'll move on. Um, yeah, so loads of people talking about um, uh, flow and all that sort of stuff. I'm going to wrap this up soon. It's one hour 45 in. We'll do two hours, and then uh, I'll, I'll finish because I've still got a uh, unplug my water changer and all that sort of stuff. So, roll bar. All for reef from Tropic Marin is good for soft corals. It is good for soft corals, yes. Uh, you probably won't need to use an awful lot of it, um, but that's one of the reasons it's good. It comes in one bottle, so you only need one dosing pump. Saves you cash. Um, it includes, obviously, calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium, but also trace elements, I believe. I think you can also get supplementary uh, trace elements, but that does include trace elements. And bizarrely, carbocalcium is the same, but uh, it's not just calcium. Bad name, Tropic Marin as well. I shamed Tunzi earlier. Tropic Marin, your naming conventions are not particularly user-friendly. Um, and I would love to get uh, Tropic Marin on a live stream one day and explain what everything means. The, the live stream they did with Reef Dudes where they explained the carbon dosing range blew my mind. I had no idea that they had so many different products. Um, but yeah, uh, anyway. All for Reef is good. I did use it on uh, the tank I have here, my frag tank, but I've switched to ATI Essentials Plus because I like ATI Essentials. Uh, but yes, yeah, fine. So there we go. Uh, beginner question, Rudra. Uh, dosing amino acids, something we should do. No, absolutely not. Do not bother. If you're a beginner, save your time, save your money. Don't add coral food. Don't uh, dose amino acids. It's not necessary. BRS did a video recently, about a week ago. It was Ryan and Randy, the best kind. And they were talking about, um, the, I think it was something like top 10 reasons your corals aren't growing or something like that, or how to make your corals grow. And they did, they ran through this list of things to do. One of them was had amino acids. But I think the kind of the point they were trying to get across was, it was, there was things like, are your nutrients stable? Are, are you messing around with your lights, turning them up and down all the time? It was running through the first like five or six were running through the basics. And then they went on to other things. And if those are all uh, all stable and good, then you might want to look at this. So amino acids is way down the list. Yeah, yeah, they, you'll find loads of people who like Tidal Gardens is a coral farm. They dose amino acids. Wicked. I'm not trying to achieve what Tidal Gardens is trying to achieve. Um, just don't bother personally as, as a beginner. Get your, your, your light right. Get your flow right. Just keep it stable don't mess around with it get your nutrients right and now apparently everyone's saying ph is really important so um i'm experimenting that with myself so but i personally wouldn't bother feeding corals for at least the first year or trace elements don't bother <laughs> for at least the first year uh so if that's a if that's a question for a beginner no, don't bother hi alex the uh ref the two parts of water tank do you need to keep adding uh the cycling medium in a new tank for the short term anyway once you add stock. Do you mean the ATM colony? No, you don't. You only need to add it once. In fact, whatever you mean, filter media, whatever, you don't need to add anything else. You just, you bang it in once and that's it, you're done. Um, oh, I see, once you add stock. So as in, in theory, you're adding more fish, so there's more bio load, so you need more bacteria. No, they'll proliferate uh, or uh, reproduce is a better word uh, on their own. So no, you don't need to add more, it's fine. Um, a lot of people do add bacteria and say it's a very good thing. I don't bother. I don't see the, the benefit. If you can show me the benefit, you can say this is a, a fact that this, this happens. 
then maybe they'll start using it. But uh, interestingly, there's a company called Aqua Biomics in the USA who test uh, for bacteria in your tank. And they have seen that, uh, I think they basically established that the bacteria you add in the bottle from the bottle doesn't last long. It does survive, it is a thing, but it doesn't, uh, people who dose it regularly don't have uh, high concentrations of it. And personally, I think if you're adding stuff that's dying um, relatively quickly, is it is it meant to be? Probably not, but anyway, all that sort of stuff. There we go. Uh, what else have we got? I think we're getting close. Oh, someone's mentioning refroids. Do you think putting in too much refroids in the tank can kill corals? Uh, no, not itself. I accidentally put too much in, and now all the corals seem to be dead. So the refroids won't have killed corals, but the phosphate that the refroids will produce will, will harm corals, and potentially if you've bung in a ton, then yeah, test your phosphate and see if it's gone up, because uh, that will harm corals for sure. I don't use refroids. I find it... Again, feeding corals, it causes for for new. If you're new to the hobby, it causes more problems than it does good. So yeah, um, and someone else is asking if you have uh, high nitrates. Are you testing precise? I put refroids in phosphate quite high. Yeah, Phos phosphate in a tub basically refroids. Um, and if you if you know how to use it and you're experienced and you've got a tank that needs nutrients and needs uh, nutrition, then by all means chuck it in. But it's not necessary. Fish uh, will be uh, corals will be just fine with um, with light alone, basically. Mm, yummy light. Uh, is Flavor Levo 52 litre good for salt, salt, salt water tank for beginners? Yes, it is. Uh, reference my comment earlier, right at the start of this video, um, when I said the only problem with it really is though it's quite small, so it's a bit limited. But yes, yeah, cool, cool tank. Uh, let's scroll down and see. Oh, Steve Tolly. I've not seen you in a long time, mate. How are you doing? Big Tank is going very well, my friend. Uh, yeah, it's just kind of, I don't, people ask all the time and I'm like, well, it's cool. I don't, I tend to do updates every couple of months because I think people want to know, but it's not a lot to say. It's just, it's doing good. Uh, my problems are that the corals are growing too much <laughs> and that's about it, but it's doing great. It's, it's doing really good. Um, corals are looking healthy. The colours are looking better than they ever have. Still not perfect, and I'm about to start dosing Calquasa. Um, probably in the next couple of weeks. I'm just getting it set up is, is a hassle, but uh, it's going very well. Uh, I'm happy with uh, with how it looks. Uh, so what else have we got? I think we might be getting close to the end. Uh, there we go. There, there are more questions, though, so let's uh, bring that up. Uh, oh, we've got another question after this as well. Ben Petrovich, uh, 80 gallon, nice cat, 80 gallon stocking ideas for a mixed reef. 80 gallon, that's uh, 160, 320 litres, good size tank. I would have a one spot fox face for, for starters, and I will show you mine, who is currently on the right hand side of this tank. I'd have one of them for sure. Uh, I would have clownfish, two clownfish. I would have a couple of hawkfish. I love hawkfish. They are technically a risk with inverts. I've never had a problem. I would have the guy on the far left in the middle, the uh, long-nosed hawkfish, and the one who's just gone to the back, <laughs> who's now hiding, a scarlet hawkfish. I think they're awesome fish. I would probably have a couple of wrasses. The one at the middle at the top, the sinus yellowy white one, is a silver belly. I don't like him now. He's uh, he's not as colourful as he was. The yellow wrasse, Halicoris cryus, is... Uh, you can just about see him at the back now. There we go. He's coming out. He's much brighter, and I prefer him. Uh, so I would have a ras. What else would I have in that tank? Um, lots of hiding fish. So the fish that you probably won't see in this shot is a uh, – oh, there's a blenny on the right-hand side. I'd have a blenny for sure. Uh, a, um, uh, a geometric pygmy perch. Quite secretive, but it's kind of a treat when you see them. They're really cool. Um, so oh, – but loads. I've done a video about stocking ideas for a Red Sea Reef for 250 top 10 fish for a red tv for 250 something like that, top seven fish go and watch that because basically you could do the same and then all right you've got a slightly bigger tank but it's probably a good place to start so those would be my suggestions uh alex i've always say this but you have cracking humor in your vids uh yeah i just that's really important to me <laughs> I try, and i spend so I, I write out my videos i take a long time to make as all youtubers say but i write them out i'll start by writing out what i'm going to say what i want to the main points I want to talk about, and then I'll I'll leave it and I'll come back the next day. I try to make it funny, <laughs> and I hate it when uh, my videos are just serious. I've always got to have something funny in there. 
and there's always an innuendo to be had, especially in the in the saltwater fish tank. Every so it's good. Uh, in fact, I want to uh, no, no mind. I'll come back to that <laughs> another time. But there you go. Thank you. I'm glad you appreciate it. And I think that's um, that's yeah. It's just yeah. It's I, I enjoy it. Uh, ooh, what are you dosing for calcwasser? Uh, what are you using for dosing calcwasser? Uh, I will be using probably a generic uh, calcwasser off the internet because you can get 98% pure uh, for a couple of quid. Why not? Um, but I might start with uh, one of the uh, Seachem. There's a, there's a German brand. I forget they make um, a, a reef calcwasser. Probably a rip off, to be honest. Ooh. You sent me a message on Instagram earlier. Um, I'm rubbish at replying to messages on Instagram. Uh, I just get tons of them, so I, ne I never can. But I saw your name flash up, I think. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to be using just yet. I'm using a Calc Stirrer, a Deltec something 500 Calc Stirrer. I've got a, um, a Vectra, no, an Ecotech Versa to feed it with uh, RO water. Um, and that's about it. I just need to get it all set up. But the actual Calc Wasser, probably cheapo stuff off, off uh, eBay. But I'm going to consult my reef guru, Sean. Unlikely that he'll be watching this, but he's currently uh, not feeling very well. Uh, and I hope you get better soon, mate. But I will be consulting him, uh, Sean from the Ocean Project down in Dorset, great local fish shop. Uh, and he is, uh, there are, there's a handful of people who I listen to uh, and take their advice implicitly. And he's one of them. Uh, so I'll be consulting him when I buy uh, Count Classic. Uh, oh, Rudra controversial mixing calc in your ato water and let it dose automatically i'm not going to be doing that because i prefer to have control over it but <clears throat> people have done that for years it, do, do you find that it fluctuates because you have more um that evaporation in the summer or the winter or whatever be interested to know um will you do a ras guide in the future i've thought so many times i've got to <laughs> people often ask me if it's difficult to come up with ideas for videos it's not <laughs> i've got sort of 50 or 100 of videos at any one time that i want to make the problem is time. And one of the videos I have is, uh, there's a couple of videos, not necessarily RAS care guides, but I want to, to show you RASs that you might not necessarily have heard of that are really cool. Um, so possibly, I don't know, I try not to do fish care guides unless I really know what I'm talking about. Um, and I kind of do with RASs, but my advice really on RASs would be avoid the tricky ones, macro for and... Uh, uh, what are the ones called the um, red tail tamarind rat, anam anamsis rasses, avoid them. Uh, otherwise, they're pretty easy. <laughs> they're not really very difficult. So, the, my, my advice would be yeah, get them. They're cool. Halicorys rasses are wicked. Um, you do need a sound bed. Some people get away without, but best to have them. But probably wouldn't have an awful lot to say. Another YouTuber in the house, Mogsy, right, Steve? Um, I saw Ross earlier and I saw Paul. I didn't get to post them because I was looking on my phone at the uh, at the comments. But hi, how you doing? Um, good to see you. And uh, Michael Butler says hi as well. I sure got a sex change. <laughs> I saw a couple of people say that on on Facebook. I thought it was very funny. Um, been doing it for one year, no problems in the ATO. <clears throat> uh, there you go. Cool. Uh, what else have we got? I look forward to Seachem. Seachem. Yeah, Seachem. I think that was what I, what I thought it was. Actually. Uh, Buying fish online, right? Okay, so we're getting close. We got two minutes, and I will wrap it up because I'm, uh, I'll be tired for work tomorrow, otherwise. <laughs> uh, Silver Phantom, buying fish online or from your local fish store, which is best, I guess you're asking. I've never bought fish online. Uh, I've bought some corals online, but I don't like to do it. I would never buy fish online because I want to see, I want to inspect the fish myself, ideally. If it's a fish, I don't buy many fish now, so I've got time to, to look at it. So I'd stand at a tank staring at it like a lunatic in the local fish shop for five or ten minutes to, to see if it's got anything wrong with it. You don't necessarily see things straight away. So I personally never buy fish online. Even colour uh, color differences. I want a fish that, I, that looks the way I want it to look. I want it to, to be the right size. But more importantly, I want to make sure it looks healthy. It's not shaking its head. Um, it's not scratching itself. It's not got spots. All these things. I would never buy a fish on online, and I don't really like buying corals online. I do sometimes, but I don't tend to like it. I prefer to see with my own eyes. Um, photos aren't always particularly accurate online. <clears throat> What's your take on natural seawater? Precise signs. <sighs> if you had a good enough source, great. But um, in the UK, 
Uh, I wouldn't use the silty rubbish we have. Even the salinity varies across the ocean. It can be very quite significantly. But I, I would also, even if you have, if, if you've got someone who goes out to, you know, fifty miles into the uh, the, the Atlantic and uh, collects it all, I would wonder about the quality of their collection bins and transporting it back. Mm. If I lived in uh, the uh, the uh, Pacific Islands, uh, South Pacific, uh, in um, Kiribati or somewhere, <laughs> then I'd use it. But no. Uh, otherwise, I personally wouldn't bother. And you can make you make it yourself. It's much easier. Uh, would it be cheaper? Probably not, to be fair, because transport costs are, are pretty cheap. But it's just better. I prefer to have control. Um, so there we go. So great live stream, Christian Corals. Thank you very much. Good of you to say. And you support. Someone said support about something you uh, supporting your LFS. Yeah, completely right. Um, and here we go. The completing the uh, the I was going to say uh, uh, a threesome, but it's completing the foursome of the other uh, live streamers, other YouTuber, James, James Real Reef UK. Sat quietly and learning lots. Thank you so much for your brilliant live as always. So Jay uh, 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 Ross uh, Bearded Reef, that's the one I'm looking for. Mogsy and Fish Palace do a live stream on a Friday night at eight o'clock every week for two hours. Uh, two hours on the dot. Uh, they kept uh, they kept in shape. Uh, it's a really good uh, good live stream, so go and check that out as well. They alternate it between their channels. And next week, they're giving away a Radeon XR30. Ooh, spicy. So, yeah. Uh, but welcome along, Jay. Good to have you. Uh, Rudra, Versa, must Google. So this is the uh, the dosing pump from Ecotech. Uh, you can't get hold of them. They've disappeared off the shelves for the last 18 months, but I got a second-hand one. <clears throat> uh, I think we're more or less we, we're getting towards the end here, so we're we're good. Right, HCB chemistry. What's your favourite SPS coral you have? Ah, oh, you know this is uh, I've got so many favourites that it's hard to hard to tell you. But I think probably I'll get out of the way so you can see the uh, uh, the, the 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 thing. That in fact, let's just get rid of me as well. Um, the the coral in the middle, and you can't really see it there. Do you know what? Let me let me get that back. It's a, a strawberry shortcake uh, is probably my favourite, but it's just oh, I've got so many that it changes all the time, and, and some are uh, some are awesome uh, one week, and then I think, oh, do you know what? The next one uh, next week, I like a different one, but probably the strawberry shortcake. I'm just going to bring up a, a better photo of it because it took me a long time to get it looking uh, as good as it does now. Here we go. So top down photo. There we go. So. That is the, on the on the top is uh, when it was looking a bit rubbish. I don't know, eighteen months ago, and then on the bottom photo is is it now? It's just uh, such a beautiful coral, and I've got I put a little acro crab in there as well, <laughs> which is cool. So yeah, there we go. So probably that, but um, who knows? And finally, I've managed to catch a, 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 a super chat, Mogsy Steve. Thank you very much, much appreciated. Um, <clears throat> Alex, enough of all this fish stuff. Let's talk bikes. I know, mate. That's, uh, that's, I've got a bike tunnel, actually, but it's, I don't really do anything with it. Um, but, yeah, let's talk about bikes. I, I ride a, an MT-10, by the way. Uh, it's a cool bike. Uh, but, anyway. So, there we go. GSP. George St. Pierre, maybe? Or uh, possibly uh, Green Star Bollocks. And we're coming to the end. Uh, wow. Well, presume that's uh, for the uh, uh, for the for the coral. It is an awesome coral. It looks wicked. Um, but, yeah, so all good i think we are pretty much done and i'm going to wrap it up then but there we go so thank you very much for joining um i don't do live streams often however i've invested in some uh, live stream kits so i've got it all set up now so i intend to do these more often it's just finding the time um but i'll do them as often as i can uh, and I, I really appreciate you guys all uh, all joining and coming along and asking all the questions and that's it so thanks very much guys take it easy uh, and I'll catch you again soon. See you later. Bye.